Hello. So thank you, everybody, for uh, coming back after lunch to enjoy more of the symposium. Uh, my name is Caleb Jackson. I'm currently a 3L here at UCLA Law, and I'm also a member of the National Black Law Journal. Um, so this panel um, is a special panel. It's about education. Typically, people don't think of education as, as a civil rights issue, but as African Americans, we know that it, that's exactly what it is. Um, and we have some amazing panelists here, so I'll just introduce them briefly, and then they can tell you more, a little bit more about themselves. So we have Professor Cheryl Harris here. She teaches here at UCLA Law. Um, we have Professor Stephen Nelson, uh, coming, who flew in from Memphis all the way to join us today. We have Professor West Falcon, Kimberly West Falcon, here from Loyola Law School. And then we have Professor John Glader, um, who's in from the University of California at Irvine. So I'm gonna go ahead and let them uh, get started. Each of them will speak about 15 minutes, and then I'll ask some questions, and we'll open it up for questions. Good afternoon, folks. Can y'all hear me? Make sure this is. Uh, I'll tell you first off, I'm terrible with technology, so a lot's gonna go on up here. Just assume that's the case, that I'm figuring it out. The other thing is I'm all about feedback. I prefer booze if you don't like it, uh, and amens if you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'll be talking about on paper, uh, could the state take over of public schools create a state created danger? Uh, that's some more stuff. I have very long titles to my papers. Uh, but ultimately, I'm a law and society scholar. I have a PhD in education policy studies from Penn State and a JD from the University of Iowa College of Law. So there'll be a little bit of <laughs> there'll little be a little bit of a lot going on. Uh, my basic argument is that uh, states have a duty to protect black students from harsh discipline once they take over schools, uh, specifically and predominantly black school districts with predominantly black school boards. Uh, I rely on the 14th Amendment. Uh, most people go equal protection, uh, fearful of what that looks like in front of this Supreme Court or any federal court. I'm going to try to <laughs> do process, and we'll see if it works out. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how I envision the school to prison pipeline first. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who think, uh, who include a lot of the testing and whatnot. I don't really focus on that in my research, though I think it's important. I'm mostly disciplined. Uh, I break it into three different components. Oh, sorry. I should. Y'all can't see because I'm pressing the wrong button once again. Uh, this is where I'm at. Okay, we should be on the same. <laughs> we should be on the same page now. Uh, the first thing I think y'all just push out, and uh, I distinguish that from some other things that you'll see later. And it's the lighter form of the school to prison pipeline. It's uh, your out of school suspension for wants or multiple times, and also expulsion with services. And we'll talk about why it's important later uh, in my research where I present the data. Uh, then I talk about a uh, shout out. Uh, I worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center back in 2010 where we found out there were roughly 4,500 students in New Orleans who were not allowed access to schools. Uh, they were told they could not be served uh, because they were uh, students with disabilities. Uh, so there's actually a record of schools actually just shutting students out from the very beginning. I also, uh, in terms of my research, I look at this from the perspective of expulsions without services. I thought that was a thing of the past, but apparently there are school districts that still tell, people, tell kids, get out and we don't care where you go. Uh, the last thing is snatch out. Uh, it's probably the most pernicious form of the school to prison pipeline because the, it, it's not really a pipeline. Student, Students are entered into the school to prison pipeline from their school. Their first contact with law enforcement comes there. It's your law enforcement referrals from the school uh, or school-based arrest. Uh, in particular, there's some troubles in Memphis. There was one school where one-fourth of all its students had been arrested on campus for some. Uh, oh, well, that's not terrible. The state of Louisiana has actually moved to actually put into their code of conduct uh, the criminal statute. So actually you can go to jail for a felony for uh, throwing Skittles, uh, which you probably shouldn't. You could put someone's eye out, uh, but certainly uh, not worthy of a felony. Uh, and these actions are generally rude, but, 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 but a little bit more, <laughs> sorry, but a little bit more than rude, uh, I'm actually going to argue that they're actually illegal. Uh, one second about how many get you to there. I want to give you a little bit of background on education, law, and policy. Uh, 
we've maintained the school to prison pipeline through our actual formalized policies in the United States. Uh, I, I looked at the three most, uh, three recent most prolific uh, policies that doing this No Child Left Behind, which remember that NAACP fought hard for all of these, this, 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 this aggregation of uh, statistics and what we didn't know is that states would start saying then we're going to put, there's one way, now that we know which population is struggling, we can just put them out. Uh, that will raise test scores. Uh, have to give them credit for being clever at math. Uh, race to the top, which, and I, I put that there because it actually was almost, if this were Super Mario Brothers, this is the mushroom that makes you bigger. Uh, gave some extra power to some of No Child Left Behind's <laughs> uh, problematic uh, functions. And then ESSA, which, the promises of ESSA were that states could use all of the school climate uh, data to actually uh, start dictating what's, how schools were ranked and held accountable. Uh, we'll talk about why that's problematic later, partially because I, coming from the South, I don't trust the state governments. Uh, but also, <laughs> dealing with President Trump, I don't know if we should be trusting it anyway. Uh, I also look at the reconstitution of schools and school districts, uh, in other words, state takeovers, uh, where my research is situated. Literally, the state unilaterally says, these schools are low-performing, we're going to run them. Uh, you typically see this 85% of these takeovers have happened in black or brown districts, despite the fact that neighboring districts are statistically within the same vote. They don't take those over, the suburban districts. Uh, you might see this in terms of uh, us getting rid of Common Core. It took 12 white middle class parents to get rid of Common Core because you could say ja Jaquan couldn't read all you wanted. But when Mary Catherine couldn't, you're not going to tell me that my kid read below grade level. Uh, I also look at charter schools, which uh, my dissertation work was on charter school board representation. Uh, it's, it's pitched as the new civil right. Uh, I wonder how that looks when we are getting rid of predominantly white school boards in favor of predominantly white self-appointed school boards, not even appointed by someone else, literally, uh, self-appointed. And the only way to get rid of these boards, literally, is to, un to unseat the governor. Uh, for some states, that might be easier. Uh, in Louisiana, we were Black people made up one third of the voting age population, and still we would have to unseat the governor, which isn't likely to happen. Uh, and part of this problem comes with the, this movement towards technical accountability. What we're focusing on is numbers. Uh, did students pass this? There's not really any uh, confounding variables, con uh, variables considered. Sorry. Uh, my legal. My legal questions and methodologies, and actually it's just all of my methods. Uh, why study takeover districts? We've been taking over schools since 1989 in the United States. Uh, I don't know how many people know that. Uh, but it, most, of, most of the time we were taking over schools, it was for financial reasons. The school went belly up. The school district went belly up. Someone has to actually run it. Uh, it wasn't until after No Child Left Behind that we started seeing increased takeovers based on academic performance, whatever that meant, because states don't have to disclose prior to the release of scores what those cut scores are. Uh, the sites of my study are Detroit, uh, Memphis, and New Orleans because they get meet the qualifications of being predominantly black cities with predominantly black elected school boards that run a lot run alongside a state appointed uh, state takeover district. Uh, most of my data, actually all of my data, came from the civil rights data collection. Uh, I'm pretty sure that data isn't available anymore. So if you need it, I can give it to you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's scandalous data, and I'm pretty sure the Trump administration doesn't want us to see it. Uh, effectively, I used a, st a statistical comparison called the Fisher Exact Test. Uh, you've seen it used in some DOJ, uh, <laughs> well, prior DOJ uh, cases. Uh, in effect, it's a proportional analysis of one category versus another. Uh, there was another legal question. If we find that there's a difference in between state takeover districts and uh, predominantly in locally run school districts, is there a legal remedy for this? Uh, and we all know uh, the legal methodology is the law conference. Uh, findings push out state takeover districts as we, as I assumed, uh, were harsh at discipline. The only uh, case that was really weird was the achievement, uh, the Education Achievement Authority out of Detroit that reported no expulsions. I have a reason not to believe that because I actually know people who were expelled you know, during this actual time. Uh, but of course, some school districts say, hey, we don't count certain things as expulsions, because I coded it differently. Uh, Memphis is also an outlier. It was the only place where we saw the uh, state takeover district perform better in terms of keeping students in school than the uh, 
popular, popularly elected school board. I think some of that has to do with one line. Uh, I'm a foster parent in Memphis, and I happen to know that there were students expelled that weren't included in the data, but also this idea of the Bible Belt, which I can talk about later in the question and answer period. In terms of shutout, there's no difference between uh, traditional public school systems and state takeover districts in terms of who shuts, who shuts out uh, black students. Uh, snatch out, also no statistical difference, and I'll tell you what that means if in a question and answer about statistical difference versus practical, because uh, some of that uh, is a term of art. Uh, but I will say Detroit public schools reported across the board there were no arrests, but if you actually Google, you'll see that like 200 kids were arrested for protesting. I don't know they, why they don't count that. Maybe they assume they deserved it, so they just didn't count it. Uh, the same thing happened for the Achievement School District, the Takeover District in uh, Memphis. And once again, I know that students were arrested because one of my kids was arrested uh, during that time. Oh, y'all, sorry, I'm still struggling, so y'all can't see any of my. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Still struggling with technology, but I'll get there. Uh, so the legal findings. Uh, so I started looking about looking to the state created danger doctrine, which effectively would allow citizens to sue the state if they create, like if they create a situation where a, a third party injures a, a citizen. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, conservative Fifth Circuit said absolutely not a very long time ago. So that answered my question for New Orleans. The Sixth Circuit was a little bit uh, more friendly. Uh, they gave three things that would have to uh, happen before we could actually see this case. Uh, the state had to act affirmatively and place students at danger of harm from a third party. Uh, the state must great greatly increased the likelihood of harm uh, in a state you or should have known about uh, the potential of the harm. My analysis, uh, both uh, Detroit and Memphis created separate subsets of schools. Uh, one subset had little accountability to stakeholders. There's actually literally no political process to challenge. There's no political process to challenge the actions of these appointed school boards. Uh, the stats suggest that increased harm in state takeover districts occurs, uh, at least at the uh, push-out level. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, shutout and uh, snatch-out later. Uh, and there's ample statistical evidence, not just from my work, but from other uh, folk, and legal complaints of dis disciplinary removals and reconstituted schools and school districts. And what does this mean under President Trump? Uh, I worry about the rollback of equity accountability measures. Uh, already we're starting to see uh, the Department of Education roll back some of the requirements to disaggregate uh, all forms of uh, achievement, data on all forms of achievement in climate and culture, specifically these graduation rates uh, and these disciplinary rates, which are really important because they're actually better predictors of academic success than uh, standardized test scores for black students. Uh, and they also led to some of these discoveries in No Child Left Behind about the inadequacy of the policy. Uh, the other thing is it places states in charge of fixing their own problems. The, the um mm -hmm. lets you know <laughs> why that's problematic. And then this idea that's re more recent arming teachers. Aside from the legal question, I'm afraid of arming teachers in a situation where black kids, the number one cause for student, black students being removed from uh, School is actually disrespect, whatever that might mean. We don't have any data on what disrespect looks like. And the second is willful disobedience. I'm not sure how you determine willful in that situation. Uh, we also know that uh, white men are most likely to bring drugs or weapons to schools, yet they have one of the lower disciplinary rates. Uh, I'm afraid if we have that kind of bias, I'm afraid of arming teachers who then can act as judge, jury, and executioner, right then and there. Uh, how much time do I have? Two minutes? I'll talk about CRC as a framework uh, later. But I do want to, uh, well, I actually can't because I have this. Uh, so one of the things I worry about is that, like, these, I, 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 in a previous paper, I talk about uh, how white people have maintained educational racism through uh, house rules type racism. Uh, literally, and it comes from, I remember playing a spades game at one of my friends' uh, 
house and literally, no matter what I did, my line brother and I couldn't win. And then finally, when they won one, they took literally won one hand and they were like, that's game. And part my French. But what she said when I argued my point, she said, house rules, nigga. <laughs> she said, you can get with it or leave. And I was like, literally, uh, this is what's happening uh, in education policy. And it's not just in terms of our K-12 policies. When we, we, we talk about uh, the decrease in ac academic performance uh, across the board for the United States, and we actually disaggregate that data, white men are still, if we just only put our white men forth, we still have the strongest educational system in the world. The problem is the people we've oppressed for so long are now the majority of public school students. Uh, so in some ways, it's chicken heads coming home to roost. Uh, <laughs> for the United States, uh, but I but I also think that this is also seen in higher education, and we can talk about that later. Uh, I'll go ahead and um, set my other colleagues have time. That's all I have. Left. Thank you, Stephen. I want to give an amen to all of that, <laughs> including the last slide, which I think is an appropriate place to begin. Um, I'm going to talk about um, charter schools and education reform under 45. Um, so Betsy DeVos uh, remains one of the leading candidates for one of 45's worst appointments. She, gets a, she got approved by a 51 to 50 vote in the, sen in the Senate and her blinkered testimony before the committee was a YouTube favorite for weeks and the subject of <laughs> SNL's uh, Kate McKinnon spot on impersonation. If you haven't seen it, Google it. It's hilarious. Um, she has her own personal history, which uh, some of you may know. Uh, she's the daughter of uh, a billionaire, a founder of a major corporation called the Prince Corporation, and she's sister to Eric Prince, who was the founder of Blackwater. Um, so she is was a shadowy figure to some extent to the nation, but she turned out to be very well known in the state of Michigan where she has worked relentlessly and aggressively for um, what she calls her version of uh, school reform. Um, and that include working to kill a bipartisan bill in the Michigan legislature, which would have imposed some measure of accountabilities over charter schools. Uh, charter schools, as you know, are basically governed by state law, and state legislatures determine how much, uh, what the requirements are to become a charter school, who can issue a charter. What DeVos was pushing for was for essentially not to have educational institutions chartering uh, being the only source of a charter for a charter school, but basically any organization could charter a charter school. Um, she also, you know, uh, was quoted as saying that school choice leads to greater quote unquote kingdom gain which a lot of people interpreted against uh, her well-known sort of conservative uh, religious beliefs as well. Um, and some of this critique has been picked up uh, in the popular press. Uh, Politico, for example, did an extended uh, treatment of the DeVos appointment, and I just want to read you uh, some of what they have to say, uh, because it relates to something that Stephen was just talking about, which is how New Orleans has figured in the whole charter school reform debate as an exemplar. Uh, actually an exemplar of, of what we want charter school reform to be. Uh, and this rests upon so many myths uh, that uh, it would take us longer than we have in this panel to go through them. But l let me just start by showing you how uh, the popular press has critiqued the DeVos appointment. Imagine an American city where parents have a choice of where to send their children to school rather than being stuck with whatever's in the neighborhood. Imagine the rapid spread of independent charter schools run privately and competing for students from all across town. Imagine the state pays for low-income families to send their children to private schools, many of them operated by the local Catholic archdiocese. Imagine, in other words, New Orleans. These ideas, choice charter schools vouchers, all have gained a foothold to one degree or another in struggling urban districts across the country, including DeVos's own home turf of Detroit, where more than half of public school students now attend charter schools. But nowhere has the revolution achieved the kind of complete victory it has in the Crescent City in the years since Katrina. The neighborhood attendance zones that define school options have been abolished. Soon New Orleans may become the only big city in the country without a single traditional public school run by a central office. Nearly all have been turned into charter schools, and the five remaining holdouts may be converted in the next few years. Overall, test scores here have improved markedly. 
So this is the picture of progress that, according to the author of this article, is threatened because the results in New Orleans, uh, the, the writer uh, argues, are both a product of these initiatives as well as some degree of state oversight, which the author contends was willing to close underperforming charter schools and to some degree hold them accountable. DeVos in this scenario is depicted as an extremist, a true believer in the fr a free marketeer who wants to remove any controls. Uh, the use of New Orleans as an example of a successful, successful charter school reform derailed by a laissez-faire extremist is deeply ironic. And given both the highly questionable presumption that SCART charter school reform in New Orleans has been successful, that in and of itself is a myth, or that charter school reform is somehow outside of, or at least not fully, a product of neoliberal notions in which public education, like all other public goods, becomes a market product. The real question uh, with regard to DeVos is not so much a shift from a model of charter school reform um, sort of on steroids versus charter school reform. The real question we have to ask is, why do we call charter school reform in the first place? Um, so with regard to New Orleans, for example, the foundations of this transformation that the article tracks arose from the wreckage of Katrina, in which the emergency became an opportunity for the experimentation and the implementation of a neoliberal model. Um, it's very interesting to think about how these ostensibly race-neutral processes and measures transformed a predominantly black New Orleans public school system uh, and dismantled it essentially, and transfer control from the publicly elected school board to private charter school corporations. Uh, while the legal architecture that enabled charter school expansion and the transformation of New Orleans was not racially specific, race was deeply implicated in the production of the enabling uh, legislation and in the policy decisions. Public schools in the majority of uh, Black Orleans Parish, which had been governed uh, by, as I said, an elected school board, have now largely been placed out of the mechanisms of democratic accountability. So if you've got a problem at your local charter school, there is, and, and for all of the problems that school, school bureaucracies are, we know the, the many, many, many that there are. Um, if now in New Orleans, if you have a problem with your child in one of the charter schools, your level of appeal is to the charter school management company. There is no longer a infrastructure of a publicly accountable there's no public school board meeting that you can go to and raise a concern. The, the next level of control above that charter school management is the state. So if you have an issue with your child, good luck. Right? Um, the state takeover uh, of these schools was enabled by legislation that created the recovery school district, along with several laws and amendments that redefined a failing school and set the performance criteria for districts subject to state to take over. I argue, and I don't think I'm alone in this, and, um, is that these provisions were specifically designed to target New Orleans. Uh, they were implemented in ways, uh, as Stephen pointed out, that adjacent and other school districts that actually met these criteria were not subject to the same takeover <coughs> that New Orleans was. Um, and in the wholesale replacement of uh, the school district, uh, public control in the school district, with charter, charter schools under private ownership and control, the major stakeholders in the city schools, the teachers, the students, and the parents were really dispossessed of any meaningful voice in the control of the system. So unlike residents of other similarly situated predominantly white school systems in the state, black New Orleanians can no longer exercise local control over public education. Um, and so while local control is often enshrined and thrown around in the context of K-12 education as a value, that actually has been used oftentimes to push back against federal or state control over um, failing districts or districts that are otherwise not meeting their legal obligations. In this particular case, local control is uh, off the books. It's, it's, it's not even part of the discussion. Um, they raised, uh, this raises a lot of concerns, not only because of the particulars in New Orleans, which as I said, we could go on for a while about how the standards were manipulated in order to make it happen. Act 35, the particular legislation that uh, imposed this system was passed in November of 2005, only months after the hurricane in an emergency session at a time when thousands of black voters were still displaced 
and their political voice deeply compromised. So the legislative foundation of charter school reform in New Orleans is a product of a process in which large numbers of black voters had no say. Um, it is also the case that uh, the, one of the first moves of the newly elected body, or I'm not the newly elected body, the newly appointed uh, recovery district was to fire every teacher and staff member in the New Orleans public school system. All 7,500 of them lost their jobs. Um, the um, formal act of how this uh, was enacted, I think, however, is illustrative because while all of this occurred under the auspices of the Bush administration, the Obama administration that succeeded it continued to carry the flag for school reform under the banner of charter schools. Obama's Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, while more sophisticated and lucid than Du Bois, du Bois was in sync with the basic premise that market forces were needed to cure what ailed public schools. His tenure in Chicago, my hometown, was marked by massive protest and mobilization against his aggressive and arguably racially disproportionate decisions regarding school, school closures, which stripped poor black communities of one of the few remaining public institutions present, the local public school. My point in raising this history with regard to New, to New Orleans is to point out the irony of this liberal critique of 45 and DeVos, which not without reason challenges some of her more extreme and incoherent views. But this critique fails to confront the underlying premise of charter school reform. Um, as one author writes, at its core, the movement has always been about more than school effectiveness, for it seeks to promote school, school effectiveness by providing distinctive school choices for parents and students and relying in part on the market. Indeed, early proponents of charter schools predicted that the charter schooling bargain would have beneficial outcomes to which market forces are an essential component. These ideas, in turn, stem from earlier reform ideas based on Milton Friedman's market-based approach to social engineering. So the origins of these ideas, at least as implemented, and I, I should point out, the original concept of charter schools was not this. Uh, when Albert Shanker, who was head of the American Federation of Teachers, first started talking about charter schools, it was as a means of looking at a, an experimental platform for teachers to develop innovative curricula that reached a broad range of students. The idea was that rather than having a top-down curricula reform, you would actually have communities and teachers working together to create uh, curricula that met local needs. Uh, he was inspired by what he had seen in Europe, and he, he attempted to, brought it back, to bring it back. However, this initial vision has long since been erased, and it's been deployed now to many different political agendas. Uh, to understand these shifts uh, would take longer than I have here today, but if we could think about how um, the, the, the whole idea of reform has now been captured by um, a, a particular line of discourse. So one line of discourse is it's cast as a defense of standards um, against the ri rising tide of mediocrity. Uh, and the rhetoric and the practice of school choice rest on the concept of education as a market good, in which the challenge is to increase the supply of quality product by introducing competition. So against the backdrop of the market, advocates argue that all families, not just the wealthy, would be able to choose the schools their children would attend, and the school choice is going to level the field for low-income parents. Concerns about this model were dismissed as paternalistic fears that low-income parents would not make appropriate choices. Along the way, this mark, as I said, this model has been married to and strongly endorsed privatization based on the perceived inadequacies and inefficiencies of the institutions of government. So in this way, the development of charters um, moved uh, from thinking about teacher control to the control of private entities, either charter management organizations or corporations set up to govern individual schools. And this is consistent with the overall ne ne neoliberal threat. Um, concretely, uh, the establishment of public schools has also involved the transfer of public money. And this is the last major pool of public money. Right? If we think about prisons as another location where a, pro a, 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 a sort of function of the state has been um, subject to a lot of privatization. And certainly, I don't want to overstate it, still the vast majority of people incarcerated in the United States are incarcerated under uh, publicly managed facilities. But what I'm trying to say is that this, uh, uh, this is one of the last major pools of public money, and they're coming after it. Um, charter schools, um, uh, however, were not just a sort of conservative uh, free market initiative. In part, what happened and what the 
uh, what Duncan represents and what this other uh, period of time represents is that um, the appeal of the rhetoric of school choice um, began to have considerable traction outside of conservative circles. And a consensus has kind of emerged among conservative and liberals with respect to the agenda. First, the appeal uh, to liberals and progressives of charter schools as a feature of school choice related to the fact that proponents of the model invoked the language of parental empowerment and local accountability. So if you look at all of these documents, they talk, they talk all about local accountability, they talk all about empowering parents to make choices, and since poor black and brown families have been mistreated and neglected by traditional public bureaucracies, the idea of having a say and actually exerting some control and self, some measure of self-determination over local schools sounds very attractive. Uh, secondly, the conservative agenda uh, became a part of federal policy, as I mentioned, not only under Bush, but under Obama. Uh, and so when uh, the Na uh, No Child Left Behind came under significant criticism that it was placing the burden of school reform on underfunded and overburdened school systems, um, this shift uh, to questioning to the question of whether or not the schools met certain standards shifted the discussion from what was the government disinvest, why was the government disinvesting in education, to the question of outputs, right? So it, it was a complete shift from the input to the output part of the equation. Um, so the federal government, at the same time, increased uh, funding for charter school initiatives at the same time that school systems were being defunded. So at the same moment money is coming out of the system, the federal government is saying, if you want money, increase charter school reforms. Um, this helped move school choice and charters from conservative to, cons to a consensus centrist project with the adoption of charter schools as the principal means of addressing racial inequality. And this is despite the fact that studies tend to show that charter schools have actually a negative effect on school segregation. That is, it intensifies school segregation for a number of different ways. I could um, say more about this um, morass of the question regarding performance. But suffice it to say that some of the big meta-analysis of this tend to show that most charter schools do no better than their traditional public school counterparts, and in some instances actually worse because of the phenomenon that Stephen alluded to of push-out. Um, with respect to charter schools, they have a lot more control, even though they're supposed to be open to any and all takers. There are ways in which they manage their intake to ensure that their output uh, meets the standards that they want. I'm going to stop now, and we can talk more in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, I want to say um, how um, heartening it is to, to be at UCLA, uh, to um, be on this panel. Um, heartening because um, following Cheryl, I have the opportunity to just jump in and say, um, Yes, I'd like to talk about the Trump administration, uh, but I definitely want to highlight the similarities between uh, the Trump administration's agenda. And, um, and as Cheryl was speaking, I was like, neoliberals, conservatives, Trumpians, yes, I'd like to lump them all together and um, say that um, the, the problem uh, is, um, is, is, is stark. And, um, and my entry point uh, to um, our education discussion um, is, um, is, is to, uh, to highlight how central the contention that um, blacks are intellectually inferior is to, um, well, just American culture writ large, but, um, but, but to justifying educational exclusion. Um, and, um, and, I, and I am glad, again, I can just start in and say I'm not saying this is just a, a Trumpian phenomenon. Um, uh, what is, um, I feel like I live in a dystopia, so I'm going to, you know, reach out and grab for something positive. Um, one thing that we can say, and I can say of Trump, is, um, you know, he, it, it's really an opportunity to see things um, laid bare. And, and so to call Maxine Waters a low IQ individual lays bare uh, what I'm here to talk about today. And so it just kind of, you know, you can just skip right to it, right, with, um, with Trump. But I, I do want to, um, again, piggyback on uh, Cheryl's point that um, 
these are, this is not just a um, conservative agenda. I think neoliberals um, are just as guilty of relying on this so-called reality. Um, and, I, and I said, I just kind of want to start, I'll just name some names and then the comments will, will rip, rip back in. Um, uh, a, 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 someone that uh, sent an article to us years ago, Professor Amy Wax, is um, in the news. Um, uh, not a surprise at all to those of us who struggled through 99 pages of black people should not have access to this resource because they lack intellectual capacity. Um, so the, to see her now having said the same thing, laid bare in fewer words, and that now being exposed um, seems like an important moment to draw these connections, to not just treat Trump as aberrational, to not treat Professor Wax as aberrational, uh, but to instead acknowledge that, uh, it, and also acknowledge that it does have some ties to um, very hardcore white supremacy, uh, that Stormfront folks speak of racial realism, and, um, and so the, the line I want to connect through is what everyone wants us to get real about, what everyone wants us to accept is that blacks have lower IQ, that blacks are less smart, that that is why whites have all the resources, that is why America has a racial hierarchy, that's why it's okay to monetize black bodies whether they're imprisoned or to monetize black bodies whether they're in schools. Um, it is a, a positive feedback loop if you start with a cultural understanding that some people will keep to themselves, just have a deep-seated belief, and we can include people of color having been part of this culture. So we are one of the reasons that um, we, we are experiencing um, differential educational outcomes is how central this is to um, our, 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 an American um, understanding of uh, what is true and what is not true. Um, it's a fallacy, but it's, it's, it's one that um, is, um, is, is so prevalent that the positive feedback loop um, relies on standardized test scores, relies on um, IQ tests, um, tests of intelligence, um, and, um, and then when on the out, the output is uh, lack of educational access at the higher education level um, or inferior um, or horrid, um, hardly disparate educational outcomes on the K through 12 level, um, not always said explicitly, but implicitly, well, blacks are just less intelligent. So um, one entry point I've had consistently in my scholarship is to be a law and person, and I'm the law and psychometrics person, the law and intelligence theory person, the law and industrial organizational psychology person, and I say all that to say that I can report from the lawyer who's gone and looked into the field of the people who study intelligence, who study uh, assessment of um, success in jobs, and say that the real facts don't support that. The real facts don't support that at all. So to the extent in your core of core, you think that um, you know that race is um, not even a, a biological category. Uh, to the extent in your core of core, you believe that uh, people of all races um, as a group um, have ample variation in intellectual capacity, access to resources, job skills. That's the truth. And there are ample empirics to support that. And even better ways of testing intelligence and job success, uh, and, I, and I connect those to intelligence because again, it's the feedback loop. Well, why do we know that it's right to deprive these individuals of certain educational opportunities? Because hey, look, they don't become uh, partners in law firms. Hey, look, they don't do X, Y, and Z. All these things uh, loop back and support each other, supposedly. Um, and so. The other observation that I'd like to make about um, the, um, the, the, the impact the Trump administration is having on higher education um, is that a feature of Trump in it, Trumpianism, or whatever I'm going to call it, Trumpism, is to lie. To lie. But I love it. I want, you know, I want, so why are you always lying? Like, God is at work, amen. Okay. I'm from North Carolina, so we got a thing going on. So 
But it's not just Trump that lies. You know, the 99-page law review article by Amy Wax lies. It, it cites articles and say they say one thing when they say another thing. Delving deeply into mismatch theorists' work. Yes, I am in the home of one of the <laughs> most famous mismatch theorists. If you actually read the footnotes and you read what the footnotes are citing, it is completely disingenuous to make the claims that are being made. Whatever version of how we talk about what Trump does, some people like to say he's bending this and he's doing that, it's lying. It's disingenuous. And at its core, it is feeding the beast of a critique of civil rights, a critique of inclusionary efforts in the education context, but in other contexts as well, it is the blacks are just less intelligent critique. And I think it's critical, and maybe even, again, I'm just desperate for some kind of hopeful way of looking at the dystopian reality of what is actually true, that it's easier to see it when there's someone who lacks the capacity to use studied vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. He just says it. Um, but nothing about his agenda if he even has one, um, is unique to him. That's why I would think that Jeff Sessions remains his attorney general. That's why his Department of Education and Civil Rights Division is doing the very same thing that the Reagan administration's Brad Reynolds department did, which is to define racial discrimination as discrimination against white men, to go after universities like Harvard over potentially considering race in a way to include and to purport that the presence of even a very small, and it is a very small number of African American students virtually anywhere, is evidence of race discrimination against whites and Asian Americans or Asians writ large. That claim, and I will continue in the effort to break it down and analyze it. it, has a lot of steps, a lot of studied vocabulary, um, a lot of pages put to it, and sometimes some regression analysis rolled in. But at its core, it still boils down to the blacks are just less intelligent critique. And so black inclusion can be attacked. It can be um, asserted to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, and I, and I, I, I don't know Jeff Sessions, I don't necessarily ever want the pleasure of hanging out with him, but I, I have my own personal theory that that's why you endure the abuse from Trump. You finally get to try and go back to the days of Dixie, that you can now rework the Department of Justice and the Civil Rights Division as has typically been the conservative agenda, in that mold, you, you push back on um, any efforts to define race discrimination in education as excluding African Americans from access. Um, what have we seen in the Trump administration? HBCUs, black people as props in the White House, uh, but without any serious engagement um, in supporting those kinds of institutions. Uh, again, a Department of Education Civil Rights Division uh, that um, is, has no interest in enforcing Title VI um, with the intent of um, dismantling or trying to combat uh, all of the things that have been discussed here. That would be the part of the federal government that would take that on. And again, appreciating and thanking Cheryl for opening uh, the, um, the door to this, and that wasn't happening in the Obama administration either. Mm -hmm. Let's just be absolutely frank. And so the silence on it and the failure to enforce those civil rights protections makes it possible for the neoliberals to say, yeah, we, we just don't want to concede that blacks are just less intelligent. We too believe it, and that's how we can justify uh, spending all our waking days in um, almost um, completely white institutions and institutions that where whites have the best access to the best educational resources. Um, and so um, that, that is uh, the, 
the focus um, I um, want to want to, to give to this conversation about education, um, and um, and that uh, what I um, would would hope that a focus on this would provide is that um, without it. Um, we can't have that access to higher education. That if we continue to perpetuate the idea that black inclusion is a racial preference or that black inclusion is racial discrimination, then educational institutions, um, to the extent they, they feel any modicum of need to be inclusive, uh, there's this external quite frank legal pressure uh, to, um, to, to fail to do so. Um, the other uh, thing I want to again repeat and, and emphasize is that it's a misrepresentation of reality and that making sure that both people of color ourselves, um, neoliberals, conservatives, Trumpians, um, whatever, I, I've got to work on that, um, <laughs> that, that the empirical reality, the statistics, the alternative, the better, um, more sophisticated test of intelligence that those results and that reality becomes more common knowledge because I, I th because the, the folks who want to um, perpetuate the fallacy uh, of black intellectual inferiority, um, I have come to the conclusion um, are disingenuous. So it's not that they don't know, it's that um, they want this information hidden. Um, and so, uh, so, so what, is, what is the damage that does? Um, it perpetuates this key central racial stereotype, and um, and and to have Donald Trump uh, calling Maxine Waters a low IQ individual um, just um, just just really, I think, um, illustrates um, how core it is because he's a he's a walking id, right? And so it shows that it's in people subconscious because he's willing to say it. Um, so I think there is um, the imposition of stereotype threat. Um, if you've got a professor like Amy Wax, um, a law professor at University of Pennsylvania, um, who says black people never score at the top of the class. Um, more recent, like we've, we said, there are several things we don't have the time to explore, but that imposition of stereotype threat, and of course we do not have to go all the way to the East Coast to identify a professor um, who has likely done that um, to, uh, to, to law students. So um, th there is in my mind um, a crucial need uh, to be more explicit about uh, this, um, this fallacy and how it is used as a, a weapon of justification, um, but not just by the Donald Trumps of the world. Thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be here today. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. It's really an honor to be here today, and it's frankly kind of humbling to be on a panel with such um, thoughtful scholars. My piece of this, my topic, is the money, um, and in the context of higher education. We've already heard a little bit about merit. Um, but to explain the policies of the Trump administration that I want to unpack today, um, first I need to provide some background and context. Then I'm going to tell you what the administration and Republicans in Congress are up to. Uh, and in my last few minutes, I want to offer some critical perspectives on the deeper enabling ideologies, some would say pathologies, um, that permit the policy moves that I'm going to criticize. There are two sets of background facts I want to start with. Uh, the first concerns where black people pursue higher education, um, which implicates admissions practices and financial aid practices, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, as well as federal policy, which I am going to talk about. Um, and the second uh, set of policies concerns um, borrowing. Okay, so black people are roughly proportionally represented in higher education overall. And I emphasize the overall because I'll, 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 I want to tell you where we're overrepresented. Um, but a smaller share of black people have completed four or more years of college. 
So the, and while 64% of students who start at a four-year college, or who started at a four-year college in 2010, graduated within six years, um, just under 40% of black students did. Okay, so these are just education department statistics. Oops. Uh, an examination by the New York Times found that black people are particularly underrepresented at the most elite selective institutions. And to the extent we want to parse within the black population, there's reason to believe that at more selective institutions, which a sliver of the population goes to, we're talking single digit, single digit percentages, um, but which get all the media attention. At those schools, black students are disproportionately children of higher income or wealthy families because children in those families, on average, get higher scores. So this is a college board slide. I love this slide because it's really hard to argue with. And what it shows you is that test scores basically perfectly correlate with income, right? Which says something about merit. And we'll have to say more about that uh, in a moment. We are disproportionately overrepresented now at one type of higher education institution, and that's in the for-profit sector. So that's there. Uh, the owners of these institutions, of the for-profit institutions, know this. And now we really get high tech because I need to show you a YouTube clip. <laughs> education department loan data and treasury department income data found that when default rates rose in the years after the Great Recession, it was driven by defaults of st by students who attended for-profit institutions, okay? Some of which were later the targets of federal and state investigations into deceptive marketing practices. <laughs> Let me get rid of that. Now, can I resume my presentation? <coughs> From current slide? From current slide. There. So if anybody wants to watch it, that's the website. Um, there are more, but that's the best one. Um, uh, okay. Students at these schools tend to borrow larger amounts to cover the cost and are more likely to default on those loans than are students attending public and nonprofit colleges and universities. So this is from that study that linked borrowing and income. Okay, which had never been done before. One of the reasons to think about this from a research perspective is the education department doesn't share data, right? So it's, it's hard to get access to the information. So these are the default rates um, compared to enrollment. You can see that disproportionately defaults are driven by nonprofit um, institutions. Okay, all of this was the case before the state and federal investigations of marketing practices of a few of the for-profit institutions that were in the news um, uh, over the past few years. For example, Corinthian, probably some of you re remember that one. I want to be very clear, I am not taking the position that all for-profit institutions are evil or that taking a course provided by a for-profit provider is always a mistake. But the numbers clearly show it's riskier to attend a for-profit institution. Black students also borrow more than other students on average and across institution types. Okay? Another Brookings Institution study found that it works out to about $7,400 more in debt for a black undergraduate who completes. And that number actually triples later because they go to graduate school, because interest compounds, because there are additional penalties that kick in. Okay? Those are numbers, and about now I'm usually asked, okay, where's the law? Uh, so let me move to the law and the policies of the Trump administration. 
Last year, the administration announced plans to abandon rules adopted under President Obama aimed at preventing misconduct in the for-profit sector. You should be questioning when you read a newspaper article that references the idea of abandoning a regulation. How do you just abandon a regulation? It's a regulation, right? Isn't there a process for that? <laughs> the answer is yes, there is. Um, there are two sets of rules I want to talk about. So now we're going to dive into the weeds. Bear with me. We'll come back out. Um, one set consists of the so-called gainful employment rules. These regulations require as a condition of institutional participation in federal student loan programs, federal student aid programs, that graduates' debts not exceed a certain share of their income, okay, over a specific period of time. And if, so if a for-profit institution fails this debt-to-earnings test, its students cannot borrow any more from the federal government to go. These schools, can, most schools, cannot operate, right, if students don't have access to federal loans to, to pay, okay? The second, more recent set of rules uh, provides for something called defense to repayment. These rules, shockingly, do what they, what it sounds like they do. Um, they allow a, a borrower to petition the education department to cancel their repayment obligation on the basis of a substantial misrepresentation, a breach of contract, or a favorable non-default contested judgment against the school for its act or omission relating to the making of the borrower's direct loan or the provision of educational services for which the loan was provided. This was uh, implemented post-Corinthian, right, to enable the Corinthian students to get out from under the debt burdens they had incurred for an education they did not, in fact, receive. By getting rid of, by abandoning these rules applicable to the for-profit sector, the Trump administration is weakening prophylactic efforts to prevent exploitation of vulnerable students and eliminating a potentially significant remedy for students afterwards. Not incidentally, stock prices of for-profit higher education providers did what on November 9th? Rose. I should have parents like Professor Carvada, right? They went, they went up. Um, in response to these moves by the Trump administration, which has essentially unilaterally decided to abandon rules that were the product of a formal federal rulemaking process involving public notice and comment and the subject of two rounds of litigation, several states, including California, have now sued, um, arguing that the administration is violating the Administrative Procedure Act, or APA. The APA requires a reviewing court to set aside an agency action if it is arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with the law. Those suits are pending. We'll have to see um, what happens. Ironically, this is the very same provision used by the trade group of for-profit schools to challenge the rules when the Obama administration implemented them in the first place. There's an important lesson here for those of us thinking about what are the tools and tactics to use to the extent we want to oppose Trump administration policies. Look at what they did and turn it around. The next important Trump administration moves disproportionately affecting black students in higher ed relates to debt repayment. First, the administration has proposed elimination of the public service loan forgiveness program. Law students take note and be worried. Okay? <laughs> I looked and looked to see whether there's demographic data, right, on who has applied for and received public service loan forgiveness. I haven't been able to find it. If you do, please email me, let me know. Um, Finally, the Republican proposal in Congress to reauthorize the Higher Education Act of 1965, which defines the federal student aid regime that we all know and rely on, um, would change repayment terms for student borrowers. And I want to show you how. Oh, see? There. Okay. Right now, there are multiple repayment plans available to student borrowers. The most generous, which you should all use, is the top one, repay. Um, which caps monthly loan payments at 10% of discretionary income, which means your payment could conceivably be zero, um, and limits the repayment obligation to 20 years. After 20 years, the debt balance is forgiven by the government. Okay. That's next one. The version of the Republican proposal passed by the House Committee on Education and the Workforce raises the payment obligation to 15% of discretionary income, or at least $25 a month. It can't go to zero and requires repayment of the full amount borrowed plus interest that would have accrued had the borrower stayed on a fixed 10-year repayment plan. This is worse. It doesn't take incredibly sophisticated math. Finally, the Republican proposal seeks explicitly to preempt states' jurisdiction over to regulate student debt collection activities. Okay? And so this is the servicers, the people that actually send you the notice and you send them a check. This is where states can step in to try to regulate their conduct. The current version of the legislation says, no, states can't do that, federal preemption. Um, expect litigation on this issue uh, if the bill becomes law. 
It's really hard for me to overstate the importance of these developments. Uh, if federal policy uh, aims to put higher education within reach of more students, this represents a shift in the opposite direction. It's a pulling up of the ladder that many of us in this room use to get into the privileged positions that we're in today. It's subtle in that access to higher education is still there, right? But the debt burden that, it in, that is entailed for too many students makes access less meaningful. So the Trump administration policy moves pose a tangible threat to students disproportionately to black students because we borrow the larger amounts. These moves also pose a tangible threat because they seek to weaken or eliminate both defenses available to student borrowers um, and to weaken or eliminate the authority of state agencies that could try to provide regulatory protection otherwise. And these policy moves pose a tangible threat because they weaken or eliminate requirements that would force higher education providers to do a better job by their students. Okay, in my last few minutes, how many minutes do I have? Three minutes, okay. In my last few minutes, let me apply a, a, a critical lens here um, to these policies. And my question is, what perceptions and arguments purport to provide the justification um, for the Trump administration's move? And there, I, there are four I think we need to focus on. Okay, um, perception number one, that possession of wealth or high income is an indicator of merit. Those who have money and consequently do not need to borrow have an advantage in pursuit of higher education. That's fact, right? But it's also normatively okay in this view. Second, th th this belief rests on a deep faith that success produces wealth and reflects innate ability. Put another way, acceptance of unequal access to and participation in higher education reflects a working meritocracy. That's the belief. Perception number two, which Professor West Palcone already unpacked far better than I could, merit is raced, right? Black people have less wealth, our families are in lower incomes, we appear less successful, and these facts are viewed uncritically as indicators of less merit. It's a short step from there to argue that student aid should go only to those with merit, and some states have already gone that direction. Um, to respond to these perceptions, we need to be prepared to argue in, political, in the political arena that merit and material success are in fact different things. Perception number three, Higher education is of value to students because of the financial benefits conferred by the degree. College educated people earn more over the course of a lifetime than those with less education. The provision of student aid then looks like an act of legislative grace. It's just being nice, right, in helping student borrowers to help themselves. That of course is not, right, what the argument was, the argument that was made in favor of the Higher Education Act that gave us this federal student aid regime back in the 1960s. Perception number four, which builds on perception number three, education is a private good. And this relates to, to Professor Harris's comment about the neoliberal project, right? That is, education confers benefits on the educated person, but not anyone else, okay? This is insidious because it undermines the rationale for government action to make higher education more available at all. And make no mistake, that is the direction we will move if we cannot change the, change the terms of the debate and the substance of federal law and regulation. To respond to the second pair of perceptions, we need to articulate a different vision of the role that higher education plays in the United States, the role that it has played in the United States, and the role that it should play in the United States. One that emphasizes the contribution education makes to the lives of everybody. That leads to my basic policy prescription for all of you, vote. I have a few final concerns I want to share with you, moving to an even higher level of abstraction now, so we're coming way out of the weeds. To succeed in making arguments about equity and access to higher education, we have to recognize that what we've done over the past 50 year, 53 years since the Higher Education Act was passed is shift much of the financial risk of higher education from the state to the student and the student's family, okay? This means that those students and families who are less able to absorb risk are discouraged from pursuing higher education. They're also punished at the back end if they do because once you're indebted, you face a different set of possibilities than students who are not indebted. The Trump administration policy changes I've identified leverage that vulnerability, they exploit it. Um, but the vulnerabilities are not new. These are vulnerabilities that, that have burdened black people I, going all the way back. <laughs> So we face the prospect of continuation of the status quo or deterioration of access. The longer disproportionate access persists, the more accepted it becomes, the more difficult it is to change the narrative. So unpacking the diverse mechanisms that work to exclude black people from educational opportunity is critical, which is why I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation with all of you today. Thank you. So I guess the first question I have um, for all of you, so I know we typically look at things, um, if we're intellectually lazy, we typically look at grade school issues as one 
um, facet of education and higher education is another. But I think if we think about it, um, the problems that black students face in grade school then trickle over into higher education, whether it's entering, whether it's the fact that they didn't get a great education in grade school and then have to go to one of these for-profit schools, or whether it's the fact that once they get into a higher education space, they're not able to compete because of the quality of their school or district. So could you all explain how both the issues at the grade school level um, and the issues at, in higher education connect and how those things kind of work out to become a cycle um, that keep black students and black parents who are trying to get the best education for their students down. That's a great comment, Caleb. I guess I would start by saying that one of the great ironies in thinking about some of the arguments against race conscious affirmative action in higher education have often been framed around the idea that the, the problem is you're trying to fix the problem too late. You're trying to fix the problem at the wrong end you need to fix K-12 to education. But what's always been striking to me is some of the same people that make these arguments <clears throat> regarding the need to shift the focus to K-12 to education have also been some of the major proponents of taking down K-12 to education. That is to say that the arguments against the state disinvestment in education are often authored by some of the same people. Um, they are often making claims about why privatizing K-12 education is the way to go. So I find it really interesting that that argument, which suggests that there is a relationship between K-12 education and higher education, is actually um, flipped to a certain extent to end up justifying the evisceration of K-12 education, um, which leads me to think about um, the ways in which um, the I guess I would say the deep structure that both um, Kim and Jonathan were talking about really animates both. That is to say, um, you know, one of the things that is historically the case is that the idea of the common school and the notion of public education actually comes out of Reconstruction, right? It, it's, the, it's the Reconstruction governments in the wake of the Civil War that actually take this up and take up the question of education as a matter of public good, right? This isn't just about, as Jonathan was saying, it isn't just about educating the freed, freed people to get good jobs. It's about the public good. And the fact that we're in this moment where we're seeing attacks on both uh, access to higher education as well as the entire structure of K-12 education, I think, reflects the deep racial lines that sort of tie both of these, um, I guess I would say, uh, interventions that are seeking to really narrow uh, the scope at both ends. Sorry. Uh, and, and I want to add that there's a history of this, right? Uh, people want to talk about Brown as this judicial fiat. Uh, if you actually read Brown too, they tell you exactly how fast all deliberate speed was. The very next line was, at a pace that's acceptable to the public, we saw a year later in Cooper v. Aaron, the state of Arkansas was like, we polled all of our people. And it's actually never. <laughs> and the Supreme Court was like, actually, you're clowning. But then we get green where we start saying, 10 years later, like, we're going to tell you how to do this. But then we start getting to Milliken. And then in 77 and Milliken, too, we, get a, we almost get the exact overturning of Brown without saying it. And then this separation of any attempt to desegregate. But then a year later, we get, uh, we get Baki. Uh, Baki was interesting, so it's interesting that they're attacking Harvard's plan, because remember, Harvard's plan was the actual evidence in Baki uh, that led us to affirmative action. But interesting enough, if you really read the Baki case, you start seeing a couple of things jump out. One, this white man was able to tell the school what part of his application they should value most. I have never been in a position where I could write a school and say, actually, there are like four areas. I want you to really focus on this one. Uh, <laughs> but more so, the Supreme Court does this really interesting move where they broaden the term diversity away from right. Like, all of a sudden, now you can be an oboe player, and that's diversity. But only for white people can being, be, being an oboe player be considered diversity. Black people get to be black. That's what you are. Uh, and we see this going throughout our affirmative action cases where we keep seeing, uh, we actually get, in the Michigan cases, we actually never hear the plaintiffs actually say 
these black and brown kids are unqualified. In fact, they couldn't, statistically. But they still are heard in court. Then you get to Fisher, where literally she's unqualified and still gets to make the case. So when we start seeing like these attacks on plans like Harvard's plan, this is a this is an intentional system to keep to minimize the opportunities for black and brown people to actually advance into the one, advance in K-12 education, but advance into higher education. Uh, I don't think this is something that's new in the Trump era. I think we've always been plotting since the very beginning to make this happen. Um, and to continue on, hopefully, the theme of laying things bare, uh, the question being the relationship between K-12 through education, um, higher education. Um, I, I, I'm thinking bell curve. I'm thinking bell curve because you don't need to read all the numbers parts or supposed numbers, you just need to read the policy prescription. And the policy prescription is no preschool, no K through 12 education, right? It's not just that black people are less intelligent, it's that the reality, what you've got to wake up and recognize is there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And that includes attempting to educate them. K, pre-K, all the way through. Um, and I'm back to that Amy Wax, 99 pages, that's, they can't take any, have any jobs either. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to get to the bottom, so what do you intend to do with us? Right, I'm uneducable, and I'm unemployable. And so I think it really <laughs> does make me want to take, I mean, I, I, I would ditto everything Cheryl said about, you know, that was always what we were told. It, the, you're, you're focusing at the wrong stage, right? That, that it's a pool problem or it's the, uh, the student problem. They didn't get this on the way through. But if you look at it holistically, it goes back to, to why Reconstruction was dismantled, right? It, it's that educating the people undermines the capitalistic scheme and it underman, um, undermines the white supremacist scheme. It's always tough to go last. Um, so I'll go meta. I, what your question um, brings to mind is a, a something that um, Professor Carvato mentioned this morning about how we use the term structure. And, and what your question really highlights for me is the extent to, it, that we need to be careful because structure suggests something rigid that we just need to knock down, build around, whatever. Um, this is what we're talking about is a set of dynamic, multifaceted, multidimensional processes, systems, right? that press down on particular populations and do not necessarily foreclose opportunity, but make it considerably more difficult. And if we don't recognize that across, right, the education and, and the employment, right, and the criminal justice system, um, then our reform efforts run the risk of being undermined. Uh, one of the things I just want to mention, you know, um, Kim's question was not really rhetorical, like what what is to be done with us if we are, in fact, <laughs> not educable, not employable. Um, I think what we've seen over the last 20 to 30 years is what is to be done with us, um, which is uh, we become um, the raw material for a mass imprisonment, imprisonment machinery. And if, uh, one of the questions earlier uh, asked about, well, how is it possible to sort of uh, use the criminal sanction system to extract money from poor people. It turns out poor people are an extremely valuable resource. <laughs> They're an extremely, and poor black people are some of the most extremely valuable resources. It's no accident that if you go into poor black communities, um, that that is where you will find the payday lending operations. And what is the rate of return on those loans? The reason that they're extremely profitable is because the people are so poor. I know it sounds paradoxical, but that's exactly the situation. Um, the, reason that, um, the reason that the location for many of these extractive policies is focused upon where they are is because it is so easy to extract what little they have. It's much harder to implement these systems in places that have infrastructure to resist it. And so 
I guess I would just offer that we're actually witnessing what the function is. Uh, and this, it, this too, you know, extends a long-standing historical pattern. Um, black poor people are very valuable resources under racial capitalism. I think I'll just ask one more and then open it up to the audience. Um, so we talked about school discipline and um, school push out, and then we also talked about charter schools. But I want to bring those two issues together. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if people remember up in Boston um, around this time last year, there was a charter school who had a hair policy that said black girls couldn't wear braid extensions um, and that people's hair in general couldn't be more than two inches in thickness or width. And so if it was down, um, of mm -hmm. course, it could be as many inches as you wanted. But mm -hmm. if it grew out, which, of course, um, at the school only applied to African Americans, um, they had to cut their hair. So black girls who were Afros or just twist outs um, were being forced to braid their hair or relax it. Um, and when these students didn't do this, they were given detention. There was even a, a case where one of the students um, was suspended. So I bring, I bring attention to this because when you have a school district, right, it's easier to police or it's easier for parents, as we mentioned, to speak up against disciplinary policies. Mm -hmm. But if you have these charter schools who are run by companies and there's no one to hold accountable, what does that mean for discipline um, for black children in these schools? First, the irony of these policies uh, that your hair has to grow naturally. You cannot convince me that Becky's French twist was natural because of gravity. Like, I just don't want to believe that hair grows that way. <laughs> uh, but I, I think, I, <laughs> but, but I, if, more seriously, I, I think, I think, the idea, uh, this, this is purposeful also, uh, this idea that we can, I mean, because it's one of the ways you dehumanize people. You've already put them into this neoliberal project, and you come in and you can do whatever you want in terms of discipline. What does it mean? It means that we start seeing, uh, so if you've ever seen Teach Like a Champion, there's this like thing, they, they control every movement. There's this way that they walk down the, uh, the hallway, and it's called ducktails, and it looks like this. Uh, you start seeing people say things like, I need you to walk in a college-bound line. And I've a JD, a master's, and a PhD. I've been to a lot of colleges more than my family would like. Uh, and I've never walked in a college-bound line. Uh, in fact, sometimes even looking at campus now, I'm like, this is chaotic. Maybe we should. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I, I look at this, and, and, and this is about desperation. Uh, coming from New Orleans, one of the things I spoke to someone from Chicago right when I came back uh, after Katrina, and someone said, Y'all are stupid for letting charter schools take over uh, your school district. And I said, I think stupid is the wrong adjective. I think desperate was the actual adjective. Uh, the reality is that we were the worst performing public school system in the country before Katrina. Literally, we ended up $500 million in a hole, and no one got fired. That's how bad it was. It was like, oh, well, I guess somebody stole some money. Uh, where in any other district, you would see heads roll. Uh, but the, the other side of that was, well, if we tried, at least we tried something. Uh, now, what I'll say is what we've seen, uh, the, what uh, I think uh, Cheryl was saying about these policies, we start seeing people get counseled out of school. It's the interesting thing. It's not a suspension or an expulsion. You start hearing you're not a cultural fit. And there's no paperwork to track this. Uh, in New Orleans, the reason we didn't know 4,500 students were out of school is because there was no uniform system to say where kids were. A kid left the school, we had no idea until they ended up in juvenile. <laughs> and then they would say, like, I don't have a school, so why are you sure I don't have a school? And we actually didn't believe them initially. What do you mean you don't have a school? That's not a thing. You have a school, why aren't you in it? And people were like, no, I went to the school, they told me I couldn't come. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that we need to lock, we need to be prepared for a much more racialized oppression because they say things like we need to change that culture. Um, this relationship between discipline policies and charter schools relates very much to the structure of the charter school as outside the usual mechanisms of public accountability. So try, as Stephen was just saying, trying to get even information from a public schools in some, some jurisdictions are not subject to FOI. 
uh, they're not subject to FOIA, you have to try to extract this information. And unless the governing, it, the governing body makes those charter management school or organizations agree to submit to FOIA, uh, which many of them do not, there is no way to actually get the information. Um, that's no accident. Um, that's part and parcel of what I think of as the new method of accountability because accountability only applies to the students and the families. That's, that's who it applies to. You're accountable for your child. You're accountable for your child's actions. And then, of course, we have the expansion of accountability for children's actions to their parents. So now the issue is you're financially responsible for what your child may or may not do. If your child does something and is fined, you're now responsible for it. But the question of the system's accountability for what it is doing is made pretty much opaque. Um, uh, and so this, um, this is going to remain, I think, a major issue. One thing I wanted to put on the table is, you know, we've talked a lot about New Orleans because it has been uh, touted as such a model. Uh, one of the jurisdictions in which uh, New Orleans has been touted as a model and is one which is being actively pursued is right here in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. So there is a program on the table to convert 50% of Los Angeles public schools to charters. This has been a long-standing project. Eli Broad and others have been putting a lot of money into this project. And part of it has to do with changing the governance of the school board so that the school board itself will sign on to this program. Um, so, coming to a jurisdiction near you. <laughs> and just as a quick follow-up, sometimes you don't even need FOIA for it. Uh, if you've ever been in a federal, federal court doing a hearing, it's actually pretty quiet. The attorney for the state of Louisiana, when asked by the judge, do you, uh, you're being accused of not following uh, the Constitution, literally said, we don't believe we have to. And that was like this gasp in the court that was like, <gasps> because we knew it was happening, but who would ever admit it in open court? <laughs> I mean, so, so I think that's the level that it's at, that they're not even hiding it anymore. They're literally saying in public, we don't care. We are not going to follow the Constitution. That's dangerous. Trumpians. <laughs> oh, settled on out there. Trumpians. Well, I'm trying. I'm back at it. But as far as being willing to lay it bare, I mean, there, there's... Credit. So we'll open it up uh, to questions. I believe we have time for like three questions so in the back. Um, I guess uh, the, the, the short answer is yes, there has been litigation regarding the question of uh, grooming and dress codes. Um, there's often a lot of cultural stereotypes embedded in the articulation of grooming and dress codes. Um, and I, 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 I think it is important to recognize that it's a non-trivial matter, right? Because what it's doing is it's communicating a certain kind of who, who is the paradigmatic student, employee, etc. I will say, however, that um, it is um, part and parcel of what I think Stephen was alluding to, which is not just the sort of regulation of grooming and dress, but the actual regulation of the bodies, like how you can present your body in the space. What constitutes threatening posture, which I have actually seen as a basis for a disciplinary action. Um, so that it, it I, I, I'm not saying that the grooming and dress isn't important, but I'm saying that it's part of an overarching kind of philosophical notion that because these students are primarily uneducable, the, the major project is to control their bodies. I'll, I'll add to that that who are you, who are you gonna call? The goals, like literally the Ghostbusters? Because you can't go to, you can't go to the school board because they actually don't govern the school. Uh, 
But this is this is about actually criminalizing blackness uh, and soon to be brownness as it expands. Uh, litigation is a poor tactic, but it hasn't been successful there either. Uh, in a perfect world, people would be able to opt out of these schools, which are actually required to go to school or be arrested. Uh, it's actually the like, schools are the perfect site for oppression, right? Because everyone's required to go. If I was going to catch all of the little black kids and train them for their job before they get too old, that's where I would go. Uh, the reality is that we we have all the evidence we need to have better schools, but some. In Memphis, a fourth of our jobs are run by FedEx. Where FedEx is, so if you're ever looking at your FedEx update tracker and it goes through Memphis, because we're the headquarters. But somebody has to throw boxes. Someone has to throw boxes. And you don't need calculus for it. You don't need critical thinking. What you need to be able to do is lift this box and move it here. But like these are in, our schools are working. They're doing precisely what we want them to do, preparing people for their subjugated positions in society. So I think geography is going to play a critical role. I'm not I'm I'm carefully ignoring your question about the most selective institutions first. Um, but I think geography is going to play a critical role because we're starting to see more experimentation across the states and making higher education more accessible. California is not in the vanguard, right? I mean Tennessee. New York, these are places that, are, that have taken steps to make community college and four-year college potentially free to, to students. So there's, there's room for experimentation at the state level, at least with respect to the public system. Um, doctrinally, I don't know that there's that much to say doctrinally um, about what the, depending on what happens, depending upon you know, what comes of, of the litigation that's underway now against Harvard and UNC, um, it's hard to know what pathways are going to be open going forward, given that, that Baki left us the diversity rationale and that's what they will target, right? Because that's the last, that's the leg standing, but. I guess. I so thanks for the time to <laughs> think. Uh, so in my pre-professor life, I was part of a legal team that sued UC Berkeley um, over access uh, to over admission on behalf of African American, Latino, and Filipino students. And we had a Title VI disparate impact claim. And U.S. versus Sandoval deprives that claim of private litigants today. So you can't sue UC Berkeley using Title VI for disparate impact discrimination. If you can, if we could make any progress on the purpose requirement or something along that lines or disparate treatment claims, if you have those kind of facts. So there could be the path to saying that relying on certain, um, certain policies and practices either make the claim they're disparate treatment um, and or see what happens. I mean, if Harvard's being pulled into court, then they're being pulled into court for receiving federal funds. So I think you're able to then sue these most elite institutions, uh, but we're, we're still in the box that Baki created and the box that our society has, which is black exclusion is presumed to be justified. So that's why I'm back to, I, I think I'm making it part of what I'm saying should be part of the project, is exposing that the elites at Berkeley, for every protest and radical thing they ever did, have the same belief system about black intellectual inferiority <laughs> as they have at Cambridge, and, and that you know, no matter who you voted for for president, that making that explicit, because ultimately they are setting and defining the terms of merit for their institution. So I, I guess that's a combination of educating and maybe exposing 
uh, what's underlying um, what things in the application are being lifted up. Because in every one of these defenses of race-based affirmative action, there's an elite institution that has the option of saying, no, these are absolutely the most meritorious candidates we could have selected and really going to the mat and not just letting Twitter do it for you as far as you know what's wrong with Abigail Fisher's application. Because it I, honestly, it's, my students hate it when I try and defend. I'm like, but that was all about test scores. I mean, we still really don't know, you know much about her. And we shouldn't, to me, it's still like, you know, you're not defined by your test score. That space is still very much open and not one elite university on the coast, either coast, has stepped in and said, we don't believe in black intellectual inferiority. We believe there should be substantial representation because these people are equally, if not more, meritorious. And their routes to that, their routes even through college board tests, I mean, th th there's just not the will. So I would say the route to it is um, exposing that. Um, and but, but the problem is we're in a power dynamic. I mean, these are elite institutions that they are interested first and foremost not about Asian Americans, um, not really about whites writ large. They are interested in preserving their eliteness and they will do whatever it takes to do that. And so our route to being included is somehow making ourselves you know, part of that um, enterprise because they're private institutions. When we're talking about the Berkeleys of the world, I think we're in a different realm where there's some public accountability. And UCLA, sorry, don't wanna leave UCLA. So there are two things you might wanna read. Uh, one, you're gonna laugh when I say uh, the other. Uh, Lonnie, Gu Lonnie Guinier's uh, Tyranny of the Meritocracy is actually really, really great. Uh, and based on that, I'm writing a paper where I actually use Clarence Thomas, Cl Terrence Cl T Clarence Thomas's dissent in Gruder because he actually takes the University of Michigan to task for relying on the LSAT, uh, when you could actually just get rid of the LSAT and you know it produces inequitable results, so why not get rid of it and have a true uh, democratic merit system where literally your admission is tied to the mission of the university. Uh, not that I would always bring Clarence Thomas up as the fighter for the crusader for equity, uh, but I think he has a point there. And, 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 and we're both, we're, I think what we're seeing is this idea about Michigan has a, a stated interest in remaining the number one public law school in the world. How do we know? Because they put it on their website. Uh, <laughs> and in order to do that, you have to have some LSAT scores. But you could get rid of it. Just one practical point, since you bring up Lonnie Guineer, if, if, if she were with us today to, to talk to you, I think one of the points she would make is this is an opportunity, the battle over the definition of merit is an opportunity to affect change, not through the courts, mm -hmm. but by agitating, right? So, so I have had this argument at, at my home institution, why don't we ditch the LSAT, and you know, the rankings matter, and if one institution opts out of the LSAT, that institution, right, will suffer. Of course, if the whole UC system opted out, then they have a problem, right? So, I mean, th there are opportunities to, to think about or organizing to demand stuff that might have pro-equity progressive effect. Okay, I got a boycott proposal. U.S. <laughs> US News and World Reports. Yeah. No, U.S. News and World Reports for the users or something. I mean, because I mean, that that is a linchpin. I mean, that yeah. that that there certain schools are going to be at the top either way, but others are that maybe would, as, as a mission statement, want to be more inclusive and have a more more um, accurate definition of merit um, really can't afford to. Because if you're right. anywhere in the middle, it's not just the institution, it's the people who are applying. So right. everybody's got some play in that, some role in that. Um, and so that would be a, a prime space for um, something that uh, the people could really control. But, but even when they first started ranking law schools, <laughs> all those deans sent out the letter that was like, we oppose it, but it was right. all like the Harvard, <laughs> the UCLA's, the Texas's, like the people who, like, wink, wink, we don't think this is a measure of our quality, despite the fact that we're number one. Uh, <laughs> make note, uh, it's much harder when you're in the middle uh, to argue, like, because then people say, is it sour grapes? Right, no, so I'm saying that 
how many people have Googled the ranking? I mean, people applying to college, people applying to law schools. I'm saying that, that not just on the institutional level, uh -huh, which is gotcha. how we think of it. I'm saying that every time you rely on a US News ranking to make an educational choice, that's perpetuating this hierarchy. And that's not something that, you know, I, mean, I guess I'm trying to think something no, that, again, absolutely. you can control. Yeah, um, the, you know, just a footnote on Jonathan's point about what would happen if the UCs um, stopped using the SAT, for example. <coughs> there was a shutter that went through ETS um, several years ago, um, a couple of decades ago, when the then president of the UC, um, faced with the inequitable disparate results as a consequence of the SAT 1 and SAT 2. And our lawsuit. And, our lawsuit and is gone. I was about to say, <laughs> and the lawsuit that Kim had brought against Berkeley, uh, Kim and her, and LDF and other organizations had brought against <coughs> Berkeley, that um, he gave us a talk in which he was sort of thinking out loud a little bit and suggested that the school might in fact step away from the SAT, there was an entire shudder through the whole system because you know how many applicants come through the UC? It is a major feeder into ETS, huge. And ETS was looking at the possibility of losing all that revenue. And they came running, they came running to him to say, what can we do to satisfy you? And he was a trained psychometrician, right? He was so trained. So this is a man yeah. with expertise in standardized testing, with a very well thought out. He had scholarship on the point as to why the SATs were not in the best interest of K through 12 education, um, and um, and we just do not know has he ever revealed what what ETS offered him or what I, they said. But that's know. why they went to SAT twos. And his grandson did very poorly. Oh. Oh, <laughs> let's, let's, not invo let's not invoke his 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 family. <laughs> it's wrong regardless of whether he scored high or low. No, but we're looking at his motivation. Well, his motivation at that point was actually to interrogate whether or not there was a justification for continuing the test. And what I'm simply trying to say is is that um, there have been moments where key players in the system have actually raised the questions that Kim yeah. is talking about. Yeah, it about. was covered in Time Magazine. It was a huge moment, but because, as Cheryl's saying, the UCs were such a, a, a huge client of this so-called nonprofit, the most profitable nonprofit <laughs> ETS, um, that they offered to do whatever, we, 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 we presume they offered to do whatever UC wanted, and that's how you got one of those iterations of the new SAT. So talk about structures. I mean, it's a very complex structure, um, and one that um, ultimately does have a profit motive at, at its core. So I'm so sorry, but we don't have time for any other questions. Uh, can we please give our panelists a hand? Thank you all for sticking with us through the last panel. My name is Akisha Anderson, and I am an attorney here at UCLA School of Law, specifically with the Williams Institute. And at the Williams Institute, we specialize in doing research on LGBTQ rights issues. Um, and I personally focus on LGBTQ rights policy, um, federal policy issues. So at our last panel, I'm excited to moderate um, this panel dedicated to sexuality and gender. And we have two wonderful panelists joining us. Our first panelist will be Professor Michelle Goodwin, who is joining us from UC Irvine, Irvine School of Law. And our second panelist will be Professor Russell Robinson, who's joining us from UC Berkeley School of Law. So if you all can join me in giving our panelists a round of applause, we'll go ahead and <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank the organizers who have put this together. It takes a lot of work uh, to do a conference. It's been a full day that I've heard has just been absolutely phenomenal. It's my pleasure to be here. I missed the morning because I was on a flight back from Israel. So I landed in Irvine, got to Irvine, what, at about 9 o'clock, did a stop at home with a quick change, hit the train, and, and now here. And so it's a real pleasure to be here, and so this talk is about perfecting the storm, because it really is the intersections of what I work on, which is law and medicine, but so much of my work over the last 10 or 15 years has incorporated criminal law, and it wasn't intentionally, 
but it was because I simply had to, given what I was discovering in my research. So here I want to begin with the poem or a piece of the poem, Sympathy, which many will attribute to Maya Angelou, but is actually written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and she takes from this. And this is, I know why the caged bird beats its wing till its blood is red on the cruel, cruel bars, for it must fly back to its perch and swing when fain it would be on its bow a swing and a pain still throbs in its old, old scars and it pulses with a keener sting. I know why the cage bird beats his wing, except we can substitute her wing. And what I want to bring to your attention today is how we think about mass incarceration and its intersections with regard to sex, gender, and reproduction. The story that we know about mass incarceration has been consistently within a male lens. For example, when Attorney General Eric Holder issued a profound statement before the ABA, many of us already knew it, but he went before the ABA and he said, we have a problem with mass incarceration, we need to do something about it. And within the context of how Eric Holder spoke about this, it was exclusively a male dialogue. Now, part of that one can understand when you see that the United States incarcerates off the map, quite literally off the map. And it's really worth thinking about that. But it happened that just a couple years after that, President Obama at a national NAACP meeting also made a statement about mass incarceration and the problems associated with mass incarceration. I was in Italy at the time, but I said I needed to get my hand on that transcript because I had hoped that, in fact, it wouldn't be featured as exclusively a male problem, though it was. Women were not part of the discourse. Now, when you look at these statistics, particularly when we anchor down at the bottom that one in 15 black males age 18 or older is incarcerated or in the criminal justice system, and then that likelihood of incarceration being one in three, that's pretty profound, but I'm still stuck on the fact that one in 18 black women and if we were to count ourselves out by black women in this room, then we could take count of who might likely end up in the criminal justice system. And that's profound. Now, our last panel gives us some indication about how that happens. Part of that is the school to prison uh, pipeline. But to give you some sense about how the U.S. incarcerates, it incarcerates more women than any other country in the world. It incarcerates more women than Russia, China, India, and toss in Thailand, if you want to, or Mexico combined. Now, notice this is not a slide from, it's not from a right-wing site. This is from Forbes magazine. All right, and that gives you some idea. Now, the flavor of mass incarceration must also be understood that it's not just adults that we're talking about. We're also talking about young people and how the U.S. incarcerates. It's also important to note that with the way in which the U.S. incarcerates its youth, it incarcerates its youth with solitary confinement. There are a number of countries that say that they will not do that. But of course, when you think about the fact that the U.S. has refused to sign on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, and that it's the only country in the world now that refuses to do so, then you can see that children have very limited protections in our country. And what this means in terms of girls, there's been a dramatic increase in the rate of incarceration of women. Between 1977 and 2007, that rate of incarceration was over 832%. You can see here that between 1992 and 2012, the arrests of girls increased by 45%. The court caseloads involving girls increased by 40%. Detentions of girls increased by 40%. It's important to know that of the facilities where girls are located, over 80% of those are lockdown types of facilities. And the reason why I mention that is because there's data that might portray this a bit softly, right? Such that, well, maybe they're not in juvenile detention, but they're in some form of other type of, uh, of state surveillance. Well, that state surveillance, you think about it, it's only relative that it's not a jail or a prison if it's a place where you're locked down and you're surveilled. 
And to the extent that my colleague, Jonathan Glader, was talking about the economics of education and racism, it's important to note, too, that in many of these systems, the burdens for paying off this incarceration falls on the individual. Now, you may have heard in recent years that many of the girls who fall within the criminal justice system have experienced severe abuse in uh, their homes as they've been growing up. 84%, in fact, have experienced some form of family violence. Now, I want to now sort of draw your attention to why I say that this is really a, a kind of perfecting storm, if you will. And part of that perfecting storm, in my opinion, when we integrate medicine in this, is that it ends up being this place of surveillance where, sadly enough, where people come for help, sometimes that turns into its own dragnet. And I want to show a video for you here. removed from a Florida hospital is calling for a federal investigation. 57-year-old Barbara Dawson was admitted for stomach pain and she later complained of shortness of breath. Well, she died less than two hours after a police officer arrived to remove her from the hospital. Elaine Cajano of our digital network CBSN is here with the encounter captured in a police dash cam audio recording. Elaine, good morning. Good morning. Barbara Dawson was discharged by hospital staff in the early morning hours of December 21st. When she refused to leave her room, they called police, who placed her under arrest for disorderly conduct and trespassing. Oh, my God. 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 Oh,
findings were really quite profound. For example, 58% of the study's general groups said they believe that black people's skin is actually thicker than white people's. About 40% of first and second year medical students also thought that it was true, as did 25% of the resident doctors who had recently completed uh, studies and training <coughs> on sensitivity. So they had misperceptions about blacks and their aging, black people and nerve endings, black people and how their blood coagulates, um, perceptions that whites have larger brains than black people, that whites have a better sense of hearing than black people, all of these things which are just absolutely absurd and ridiculous. But I think it's very telling that at one of the nation's leading medical centers, its medical students and the residents still continue to have these profoundly misguided um, race-based views about black people. And since our panel is focused on 45 and what's happening in the year 45 and reproductive health, I want to turn to that because reproductive health also has its medical space. Clearly it does. And as you can see just through a series of headlines with regard to reproductive health, this is not the greatest time for women under this administration. So HuffPost, in one year Trump dismantled reproductive rights around the world. Vox, how many women's, how women's reproductive rights stalled under Trump? Planned Parenthood, six ways the Trump administration and Congress have threatened women's health in just a few months. Good Marker Institute, which is not a political organization, it just simply does empirical research. Taking stock of year one of the Trump administration's harmful agenda against reproductive health and rights. This is actually NBC. Right? So NBC, Trump's budget is an unmitigated disaster for abortion rights and reproductive health. And that's really saying something when you have you know, news organizations that you know, claim to try to go the middle line making such statements as this. And here's the hill, the Trump administration is coming for women's health and bodies. That is to say that it's, it's real, it's not illusory, the status of women's reproductive health and the threat that women are under. And I want to put this in context for you since we are talking about what this means under a Trump administration. And that is to say, in 1966, Dr. King received Planned Parenthood's first annual Margaret Sanger Award. How many of you knew that Dr. King actually received an award from Planned Parenthood? It's most significant annual award. And he did not reject receiving it. He happily received it. Now, I have to put this in context because he was likely being arrested someplace, and so his wife, Coretta Scott King, received this award in his place. But the speech that he wrote forward is worth you all looking at because in this speech, Dr. King said it was urgent and necessary for women to have control over their own reproductive health and what he called family planning. He called it cruel for a child to be born into a family where it was not wanted. He said that there was no way that a woman coming from an agrarian economy where having 10 children was the norm, that she could possibly have any kind of a life in an urban center living in a tenement. Dr. King said long before Derrick Bell did that if there were aliens to visit the United States, they would say that our country is governed by a group of insane men. That's a quote. That's Dr. King. But if you don't want to go as far as Dr. King, think about George Bush 1. In 1969, before the United States Congress, George Bush pushed the agenda for Title 10. Title 10 is the funding for poor people's access to family planning. He said we need to take the sensationalism out of this issue. It was George Bush who pushed this agenda. It was Richard Nixon who signed Title 10 into law. That's worth noting because under the Trump administration, one of the first targets of this administration has been to suffocate Title 10. It's already been chopped in various ways, meaning that any organization that provides reproductive health care services such as abortions now may be removed from Title 10 reimbursement. Now what this means, and it's important for you to know, is that 
most reproductive health organizations that do abortions also pri provide this Title X services, right? They do soup to nuts, A through Z of women's health care, right? So when they are put out of the Title X business, where will poor women go? Where will poor women go when their clinics shut down? And I can shortcut to the answer for you. In Texas, they experimented with this. The Obama administration pushed back. But when Texas did experiment with this, not only did the rate of what are called Medicaid-funded uh, births increase, but so did women's maternal mortality rate. The United States now leads all developed nations in maternal and infant mortality. In fact, the United States ranks around 50th in the world in maternal mortality. Texas is considered the deadliest place in the world, in the developed world, for a woman to give birth. It would be safer for a woman to give birth in Bosnia than in the United States. That's where these attacks now stand. And I will tell you, given that California is now in uh, litigation with crisis pregnancy centers in a case that's about to go before the United States Supreme Court, California is no panacea, but it's actually one of the best uh, states in the country for women's reproductive health care. And so it's not a surprise that California is the safest place for a woman in the United States to give birth. So what does this all mean and how do we put it in context? Well, I think it's important to note that this is not just a moment of 45, right? But this is a moment that we can pace back. It's important to understand that the attacks on women's reproductive health care have to engage with what's happened to black women and Latina women. And I would suggest that, in fact, had women's health and rights organizations actually paid attention to what was happening to black women in the 1980s and 90s, we actually wouldn't find ourselves quite where we are now. And what I'm referring to here is what was called the crack epidemic, the you know just say no campaigns of uh, Nancy Reagan. It was during a time such as that that uh, prosecutors began uh, entering literally the maternity wards when black women were giving birth and arresting black women. At the Medical University of South Carolina, there were black women actually dragged out of that hospital in shackles and chains and their bloodied gowns. The Medical University of South Carolina had developed a program where they conspired with police and prosecutors to create a dragnet uh, of patients who used illicit drugs, only they were only concerned about women who had used crack during pregnancy. It's important to note that as part of that dragnet, they actually put up billboards around town. If you've suffered from drug addiction, come in and you're pregnant, we want to help you. Little did these women know that help meant that their medical records would be sent to police and to prosecutors. And it's also important to note that even with the use of crack, which we know there's really no disparity between the use of white women's use of crack and black women, but this was deeply racialized. The one white woman who ended up arrested under this platform on her chart, you guys might suspect what it was, Nurse Brown, who was one of the leaders of the program, wrote, she lives with Negro boyfriend. So deeply racialized. Then what did this mean in states like Wisconsin, where there wasn't criminalization, but civil incarceration? In Wisconsin, there was a law that was uh, euphemistically known as the crack baby mama's law that provided for any reason the state could civilly incarcerate a woman for the protection of her fetus, right? And, and this was primarily targeted at black women, though it's really important to note, and it was said in the last panel, that there's a flavor of this that's chickens coming home to roost because just a couple years ago, Alicia Beltran, who's not black, the white woman in Wisconsin, went to her medical providers and said, I'm so happy that I'm pregnant. I have a great house. I have a great job. And at a prior time in my life, um, I was using painkillers. And I'm so happy that I'm not. And in fact, all of the blood work that was done on her would suggest that that was absolutely true, absolutely clean. But that didn't stop five police officers from surrounding her house dragging her before a court, 
a judge appointing a lawyer for her fetus, none for her, and Alicia Beltran serving over 70 days in incarceration in the state of uh, Wisconsin. All right. Now, what's also very interesting about this is that in the early 2000s, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association began to roll back their claims about what a crack mother was or crack babies. And in fact, they said they would never use that term again because all of the research, the credible research by Dr. Hallam Hurd of the University of Pennsylvania, Claire Coles at Emory, had determined that there weren't the types of indicators that had been so sloppily used by news media organizations in the 1980s and 90s. In fact, Hallam Hurt's work showed that really, you couldn't really tell the difference between a child whose mother had used crack in utero versus ones that had not in Pennsylvania. And in her study, you had to have used crack at least 50 times during your pregnancy to qualify to be in the study. Now, what's very clear is that, you know, crack is not like candy, and I'm not suggesting that anybody should think of it in that way. But what was also very interesting, if you speak to these researchers, they were blackballed during the 1980s and 90s. None of the news organizations wanted to cite their research at all because their research wasn't telling the narrative that was a politically popular narrative. And I include this slide from the New York Times because the New York Times finally rolled back its rhetoric too. What was interesting is they did it in video, they didn't do it in print. All right, so where does this narrative come from? Well, a lot of it has been fed by welfare queen mythology. It's important here to note that when Ronald Reagan, who launched welfare queen rhetoric in the 1980s and did so when launching his campaign that a governor from California would choose of all places to launch his campaign from Philadelphia, Mississippi. Now you'd have to wonder of all the places in the world, why would you launch in Mississippi and why would you launch in Philadelphia, Mississippi? And some of you history buffs here know the only thing that Philadelphia, Mississippi is known for were the murders of, Good, of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, right? Three young civil rights workers, right? But this rhetoric includes this, right? So the most dangerous place for an African American is in the womb, right? And so how has it panned out? Well, it's had a direct impact on incarceration. The rate of incarceration for drug use for women now exceeds that of men. Right, so the rate is higher for illicit drug use and arrest and incarceration for women than it is for men. Our prisons are deeply overpopulated. And if you want to just take a look at the money behind this, we toss a lot of money at this and there are incentives for doing so, right? Not the incentives that it actually will help the women and the girls involve, but incentives, incentives involving private prisons and so forth. And here I think it's important for you to see just what this all means. The rate of drug addiction in blue versus how much we've spent. I'd say that that's just simply a failed uh, platform, and it is, <coughs> right? So this has really become a public health problem, the way in which we massively incarcerate people and the way in which we massively incarcerate women. And of course, it's faulty, it's economically faulty. We do far better actually providing uh, rehabilitative health services. And of course, if we just think about Barbara Dawson's case, right? <sighs> the police should stay out of uh, our hospital rooms. That's just the bottom line in reality, right? But if we are talking about addiction, we know that incarceration simply doesn't work. In New Jersey, it's less expensive to send someone to Princeton than it is to incarcerate them. And the rate of recidivism is high, right? I'd imagine, how many of you have Apple product of some sort, right? A lot of you do. And if your Apple product failed 40 to 60% of the time, you'd probably stop buying Apple, right? You probably would. If it wouldn't turn on four times out of 10 or six times out of 10, or you had to take it back to the Mac store that many times, right? You'd say, forget this product. But we keep doing this over and over again. Now, as I come towards the end of my talk, I want us to think about what mass incarceration means more than just simply the inputs, but also how it impacts people's lives. My work takes me around various parts of the globe, and so 
When I've been in the Philippines doing work on <laughs> sex trafficking, the first time that I was there, I was stunned by a conversation that I had with a woman who was a political dissident, and her children were forced to be raised behind bars with her. And I thought, that's very cruel. Who dares have children raised behind bars? But now, as a measure of good, uh, for good behavior, women get to raise their kids behind bars with them. And this is just a photo that reflects that, right? And the likelihood of a child having a parent behind bars for African Americans, it's one in nine. And I like to think about the work of my colleague, Kristen Turney, in this regard, because Kristen's work basically reveals that for a child who has a parent behind bars, that kid will fare worse than the child who's experienced a parent's death. Now think about that in the context of what it's meant over the last 20 years, 30 years, for black and Latino children. If they have been faring worse physiologically and psychologically than if they have had a parent die. And then think about whether or not our schools have tried to be responsive to that. Now you might want wonder, given that I've been speaking about race and black women, Latina women, why do I have a photo of a white woman up there? Well, because these things do come back. And this is a good friend of mine, Sue Ellen Allen. Sue Ellen grew up Republican with pearls and whatnot in Texas. Sue Ellen married a man who cooked the books and she went to prison for seven years. Sue Ellen had breast cancer behind bars, and fortunately for her, it was diagnosed right before she went in. But how I met her was through an op-ed that she wrote about, quote, having her breasts chopped off, but having to be in holding cells with rats and roaches, being shackled while the procedure took place, nobody being able to be there to provide any support for her, prison neglect, medical neglect, because, in fact, for if you know anyone who's had breast cancer and who's had a mastectomy, you know that they need a special pillow so that their muscles don't atrophy. In Arizona, the prison refused to provide that. Sue Ellen's whole idea behind race, incarceration, and whatnot changed because the people who provided her the pillow were the women who were incarcerated with her. Now, it's not like they just had pillows or could go on Amazon and order them they actually made them from their sanitary napkins. They wove together Kotex pads to make a pillow for her. And since they knew she had been wealthy, they put little fringe on it. And she gives a talk and pulls out her pillow with the fringe on it. But they saved her life. When Sue Ellen got out, she founded an organization named Gina's Team. Now you might wonder why she didn't name that Sue Ellen's Team. After all, she went through some pretty dramatic things in Sheriff Arpaio's prison system in Arizona. But it was named for Gina's team because she had a 25-year-old cellmate who was in on drug charges. And, and this cellmate, Gina, had four kids at home. She had been complaining that she had severe headaches, that when she ate, it felt like glass, cutting into her gums. The women at the prison begged for even a thermometer. They said she has a fever. Please just give her a thermometer. They refused. On the day in which she finally got a thermometer, she lapsed into a coma and she died three days later. Last year, Sue Ellen called me when I was out in Massachusetts to give a talk, and it was in the middle of the night, and she was crying. And I said, Sue Ellen, it's fine. What happened? It's OK. And she said, Gina's oldest daughter just shot herself tonight in the head. These are some of the ramifications of what I'm talking about, how there are these systems effects. And they, in, they involve all sorts of penalties post incarceration. But in my final couple of minutes, here's what I want to turn to, what it means for the children. Right? Well, let me just fill this in. So we have nearly half a million children that are in foster care. Only 4% are going to live in adoptive homes. Given the rate of incarceration and the, minimal, the minimum years associated with a drug charge, usually people will lose custody of their children by the time they get out. And I think this is what's most telling, and then I'll conclude. By the age of 23, and this is based on a study that's been done at the University of Chicago in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin and Illinois, 
It's a longitudinal study that has followed children in foster care who've aged out. By the time they're 23, less than 50% are employed, almost 25% are homeless, more than 75% are pregnant after leaving foster care, nearly 60% of the young men have been convicted of a crime and more than 80% arrested. And then if we think that this does anything better for our society, and it's perfect coming right on the heels of the education panel, only, two, only 6% have a two to four year degree after being in the byproduct system. So these are issues for us to be deeply concerned about. Here are other spaces in which you can find more information. And during the Q&A, we can talk about some of the things that we can actually do to make this system better. My colleague, Jonathan Glader, said one of the things that we have to do is be mindful and vote. And that we definitely have to do. We have to have more people running for office, more women running for office, more women of color running for office. And we have to be engaged in much more dynamic and nuanced ways. I'm going to end my talk here and then would be very happy to take Q&A after. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, late in the day. Uh, it's a delight to return home to UCLA. I started my career here back in 2004 and to see some dear friends and mentors and to be on a panel with Professor Goodwin twice in six months. I know. Really lucky. Um, and thank you, the students, for organizing this uh, conversation today. Uh, I just got here off a plane like an hour ago, so I'm really happy that I was able to make the tail end of this program. Um, this symposium focuses on the effects of the current president's policies and judici judicial appointees on the black community. So I struggle on a daily basis with how much bandwidth I want to devote to Trump, uh, whether that will be healthy for me to think about him uh, day and night, um, and how to also make sure that I don't let what's happening in the headlines divert my own research agenda and the things that I think matter, whether or not it revolves around Trump. Uh, so I'm going to try to split my time being aware of that dynamic. So I'm going to um, spend most of my time talking about um, some recent cases on the intersection of sex and sexual orientation and the Trump administration's policy with respect to Title VII. And I'm going to turn to one of my own projects uh, that uh, is very dear to me, um, although it's not on the headlines, but I think it should be on the headlines. Uh, and that's thinking about uh, the issue of intimate relationships and racial preferences, with a particular focus, since we're, this is a National Black Law Journal, on how these issues play out in the black community. So for decades, courts consistently interpreted Title VII's ban on sex discrimination not to encompass sexual orientation discrimination. Title VII, by its terms, does not mention sexual orientation. However, in the last year, two prominent courts uh, the Seventh Circuit and the Second Circuit held that Title VII does ban sexual orientation because it is a part of sex discrimination. So this is Kimberly Hively, the plaintiff in the Seventh Circuit case, which was the first case, uh, the first appellate case to hold this. Uh, so back in 2015, during the tail end of the Obama administration, the EEOC adopted this policy that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination, and it urged the Second Circuit to embrace this interpretation of Title VII. In a highly unusual move, so you have, of course, the election, and Jeff Sessions becomes Attorney General, and they don't agree with what the EEOC did. And so the DOJ files a brief repudiating the EEOC's position and saying 
uh, that the court should hold that the law does not ban sexual orientation discrimination. Ultimately, the Second Circuit en banc opinion rejected the department's position, although it said that the text of the law requires that conclusion, it did not defer to the EEOC. So anyone who's had administrative law knows that there's a lot of debate about when courts should defer and whether the EEOC gets deference. So this is not an opinion based on deference. Instead, this is sort of based on the plain text of the law. Now, I'm going to focus on the Zarda opinion. This is the Second Circuit opinion, which I consider to be stronger than the Hively opinion in the Seventh Circuit. Donald Zarda was an openly gay man who worked as a skydiving instructor at Altitude Express. His job required him to lead tandem skydives. I don't know if anybody here has gone on a tandem skydive, but apparently it involves being strapped hip to hip and shoulder to shoulder with the instructor. Um, and so Zarda said that some female clients felt uncomfortable being so close to a man for their skydive. So in some cases, and including in June 2010, Zarda sought to, to address their concerns by saying, don't worry, I'm gay and I have an ex-husband to prove it. But this effort to work his identity, Professor Carbato might say, actually boomeranged because this woman was homophobic and did not want to be strapped you know, hip to hip with a gay man. So she even alleged that Zarda touched her inappropriately. Um, and the client ultimately insisted that Altitude Express fire Zarda, and the company complied with her wishes. So Zarda brought a federal lawsuit alleging that Altitude Express's decision was based on sex stereotyping and sexual orientation discrimination. The Second Circuit first held that Title VII applies to sexual orientation discrimination because, quote, sex is necessarily a factor in sexual orientation. So specifically, to identify the sexual orientation of a person, we need to know the sex of that person and that of the people to whom he or she is attracted. The court's second rationale, so for example, of course, a gay man is a man who is attracted to a man, right? So um, gender, sex define the category. You can't really understand sexual orientation without taking gender into account. The court's second rationale was that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of gender stereotyping. Here the court drew on Price Waterhouse, where the Supreme Court established that discrimination based on the belief that a woman should walk, talk, and dress femininely is impermissible sex discrimination, right? So your employer can't say women have to be a certain way and men have to be another way. Zarda claimed that in his workplace, uh, he was treated as not a real man that it was a macho environment and that uh, people made comments indicating that they thought that he was not man enough because he was gay. Finally, the court said that, um, oh, oh, so, and so the court said in Zarda that um, heteronormativity, the belief that men should desire only women and women should desire only men is the ultimate gender stereotype, right? If you think about all the things that real men do, right? Um, they don't wear dresses, they don't wear makeup, <laughs> they don't sleep with men. Right? And so that, that theory sort of says that, look, if you are gay, the very nature of desiring men um, contravenes the stereotype of what it means to be a man. And then the final theory that the court offered was that punishing men for having relationships with men is a form of associational discrimination. And here the court turned to race precedent. So earlier cases in that circuit established that when an employer discriminates against a white man because he's married to a black woman, it is discriminated against that man because of his race, right? Uh, so the court concluded that that logic also applies to associations based on sex. Recall that Zarda was fired because he disclosed that he had married a man. So that association with a man was treated as an association that sort of triggered discrimination based on sex in the same way that an interracial relationship could trigger discrimination based on race. Now, the Trump administration tried to justify sexual orientation discrimination as, quote, equally applying to men and women. It said an employer who fired gay men but not lesbians would violate Title VII. But firing both gays and lesbians is perfectly fine because it's gender neutral. And the Second Circuit basically replied, two wrongs don't make a right. Here again, the court looked to race and specifically Loving versus Virginia, which rejected the argument that restricting white people's marital options and black people's marital options somehow like counterbalances the discrimination and makes it okay. But the strongest argument against the Second Circuit's holding, and I have to say, you know, for years, 
I found this to be compelling, and I'm really actually grateful for this opportunity to think deeply about these, this longstanding um, you know, precedent saying Congress didn't intend to uh, ban sexual orientation discrimination, and so that intent is what really matters. That's the main argument that courts in virtually all the other circuits have held for years that sort of, despite the language of the statute, that look, Congress didn't intend to, um, to ban sexual orientation discrimination, so we're gonna interpret the law based on that intent. Um, and so that argument, though, actually is quite flawed, right? So this, again, the DOJ relied heavily on sort of saying, look, um, the Congress of the 1960s did not intend to ban discrimination against gay men and lesbians. Um, and so, the court, you are basically amending the law instead of letting Congress do its work. Um, but the problem with confining Title VII to practices condemned by Congress in the 1960s is what we might call the madman problem, right? So it proves too much. Under that theory, um, this is Mad Men, one of my uh, departed favorite shows. Um, under that theory, um, sexual harassment wouldn't be a form of sex discrimination, right? So in the 70s and 80s, based on legal scholarship, courts begin to recognize that discrimination based on sexual, that sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination, right? Whether we're talking about quid pro quo or hostile environment discrimination. This is the scene where Joan is, um, offered a partnership if she sleeps with one of the clients, right? Um, and so in the 1960s, that wasn't seen as sex discrimination, that was just seen as like life or the workplace, like just how things operate, right? And so if you're gonna confine the interpretation of Title VII based on 1960s norms, then we're gonna have to eliminate sexual harassment from the scope of Title VII. And maybe even more dramatically, in 1998, none other than the late Justice Scalia wrote for a unanimous court in the on-call case that Title VII even protects men from sexual harassment perpetuated by men or women, and that this doesn't depend on the harassment emerging from sexual desire. Okay, so on-call, the male plaintiff was harassed by a gang of straight-identified men who denigrated him with gender-based epithets, groped him, and threatened to rape him. And Scalia said, this is covered by Title VII, even if Congress wasn't concerned about this. So Congress did not have either of these problems in mind when it enacted Title VII, or more precisely, Congress probably didn't consider these things to be a problem, right? But because the terms of the law cover these practices, they are included within the scope of Title VII, irrespective of what the legislators actually intended at that time. So in my view, Zarda is consistent with a long line of opinions, including Price Waterhouse, that interpreted the statute against the backdrop of evolving social understandings of sex and gender. Um, and so what you sort of see is that the court is gradually incorporating evolving understandings of sex and gender into the law, and that the law then changes based on those norms. And although it's not explicitly cited in some of the opinions in these cases, <clears throat> I think that the major revolution at the Supreme Court in constitutional law around same-sex intimacy and marriage uh, culminating in Obergefell is a major factor in terms of these appellate courts saying, we're now ready to reconsider what we've long said about Title VII and see if a more capacious understanding of sex is permissible, right? So the cultural milieu is informing the way that courts interpret uh, the idea of sex, even though the language in the statute has not changed. <clears throat> So intersectionality, um, a concept first articulated by Professor Crenshaw, provides, I think, a useful way of understanding the relationship between sex and sexual orientation. Intersectionality teaches us to resist thinking of concepts such as race and sex um, as distinct, and to pay attention to the ways in which systems of power render people vulnerable when race and sex, or in this case, sex and sexual orientation, converge. Neither Court of Appeals majority opinion mentioned intersectionality, but I think their analysis is generally consistent with an intersectional approach to discrimination. And I wish Professor Crenshaw was here because I actually wanted to get her views on this. Um, I think it works, but I really would want to hear from the expert. Um, so Judge Lynch, joined by Judge Livingston, dissents in Zarda, and it's a very curious opinion. If you're interested in like some bedtime reading, you know, just <laughs> rifle through this opinion because it's quite interesting. Um, he seemed to go out of his way to display a command of anti-discrimination law, history, and legal scholarship. He threw in a reference to the Me Too movement, 
Um, and then there's this footnote where he asserts that the civil rights movement has persistently overlooked the intersectional ex existence of black women and other women of color. And then he cites Professor Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins article. But his engagement of intersectionality was rather superficial. So he did not perceive the tension between drawing on the concept of intersectionality and insisting that homophobia is, quote, a different kind of prejudice than sex discrimination, and that homosexuals are, quote, a different category of people than men and women. The idea that you could be a man and gay apparently did not occur to him. And so he sort of like repeatedly insists that discrimination against persons based on sex has had in law and policies a meaning that is separate from that of discrimination based on sexual orientation. So again, he's trying to disaggregate identity and discrimination, even though we know that somebody is a lesbian and a woman. You can't pull these things apart and interpret being a lesbian outside the context of being a woman. So it's as if he thought that if he just kept repeating it, it would ultimately become true. But as Judge Wood said in Hively, it would require considerable calisthenics to remove the sex from sexual orientation. So Zarda and Hively are particularly important because prior law rewarded plaintiffs uh, for being closeted about their sexuality, right? Whether they were closeted before the discrimination arose or whether the lawyers decided to closet them in terms of how they presented them to court. And the reason why um, plaintiffs have been and remain incentivized in some jurisdictions to deny their sexual orientation is because some courts have held that someone like Zarda who alleges that he suffered from gender stereotyping and sexual orientation discrimination loses because Title VII does not apply to sexual orientation. So rather than trying to tease apart, okay, uh, whether there's a valid gender stereotyping claim that could be independent of sexual orientation, these courts treat the sexual orientation element as corrupting an otherwise valid gender claim. That means that the law protects a straight woman uh, whose employer demands that she act feminine, but not a butch lesbian who suffers from the same norm. So as a result, in these jurisdictions, closeted gay, lesbian, and bisexual plaintiffs um, are incentivized to, they have a better chance at winning than those that are out. So this is a case involving Darlene Jesperson, uh, who was, uh, um, worked at Harris Casino and said she shouldn't have to wear makeup. Um, and she was framed as a heterosexual woman who just didn't want to wear makeup. Uh, and there was some dis debate about, like, was she really a lesbian who just couldn't say that in court because the lawyers decided that that would make her case vulnerable. So that's sort of where the law left things and actually still leaves things in, in um, some jurisdictions because Hively and Zarda are not the majority rule, right? Um, and also in these cases, sometimes the defendants try to out the LGB plaintiff that is closeted uh, and say, no, there she's a lesbian and that's why we discriminated against her and it's legal. Right? And so you can sort of see the perverse incentives that this law provides. Um, and I think that's part of the pressure that also led these courts to say, we've got to abandon this attempt to draw a distinction between sexual orientation and sex gender. All right, so now I'm going to pivot to my own work, things that I'm thinking about now and writing about uh, that I'm very passionate about. Um, and so maybe we'll take Darling. Oh, well, we'll leave her there for a minute. Um, so this is um, a project that uh, is growing out of actually um, work that I began at UCLA, I think back in 2007, um, thinking about structures and race and gender and how those factors determine one's opportunities for relationships. So the first iteration of this broader project is a piece called LGBT Equality and Sexual Racism that I'm co-writing with a psychologist and public health scholar, David M. Frost. And this is a part of a broader project about race and intimate decision making. And one of the things that we're doing through this project is interviewing 100 LGBT people about their relationship history over their lifespan and asking them the extent to which race matters in their relationships. Like, do they have a preference for a certain race? Are there patterns? Um, I've interviewed people, you know, who will sort of say, like a white woman that says like, oh yeah, I've always dated white people. And then I'll say like, you know, do you have any theories as to, you know, why you've always dated white people? And so it's, it's, it's always interesting to sort of see how people explain their romantic preferences, how they ended up with the person that they're with, um, or how their relationship history makes, how they make sense of that in their own mind. Um, and an impetus for this project occurred in 2014 when one of my favorite students, a black gay male student, emailed me after Michael Sam became the first openly gay football player to be drafted. Now, you may not remember who Michael Sam is. 
uh, but uh, this is a photo of him with his boyfriend. Uh, and so when this historic moment happened, he uh, celebrated with his boyfriend, he kissed him, and a video uh, went viral of them celebrating. And so my student emails me a clip of the video, and the subject line says, it's official, black love is dead. And I was like, oh, whoa, what? <laughs> um, and so I asked him to say more. Um, and basically, the conversation that I had with him led to this project, which is sort of thinking about the stories that we tell about interracial relationships, right? The stories we tell in black communities, the stories we tell in LGBT communities that are majority white. Uh, and you can expand this to stories told in Asian communities and Latino communities, right? Um, but thinking broadly about um, not just, because I think where we began was sort of talking to people in these interviews about their own experiences, right? So part of the project is sort of how does the subject understand her relationships and the racial contours of her, uh, of her dating history? But then there's also sort of how do other people understand you and to what extent are there disconnects between your experience and how you're read in your community? So this conversation with the student led to three programs that I've conducted, the last two at Berkeley on Valentine's Day, um, on black love, right? And, and it's, it's really, uh, I've learned a very intense issue for many of my students because many of them um, lived, grew up, went to school in mostly urban, black, usually East Coast environments, maybe Midwest like Chicago, and they moved to the Bay Area and suddenly not so black, right? And so you're trying to figure out, okay, now wait a minute, if I've always dated black people and now I'm in a school where there are so few black students, like what do I do, right? And so I've learned a lot from talking to students. Of course, this also stems from my own personal experience, living in New York City, um, only dating black men and then moving to California and realizing like, I'm in Westwood, where are the black men, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, one iteration of this uh, project, um, I basically just showed some images of celebrity couples, interracial couples, and I asked the students, like, and it was, you know, all, you know, basically balsa students, right? Um, and so I just said, like, tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this couple. You don't have to filter it. This is safe space. Um, and so it was really interesting to see their reactions. So I think this was the first image that I showed. Um, this is Omari Hardwick from Power that some people might have seen on Stars, uh, And so the re students' reactions were uh, fairly negative. Um, and um, in fact, there's apparently been a lot of online critique of the wife. Um, and a lot of the comments that came up were uh, about not just her being white, but um, her not being that cute, as the students said it, at least compared to him. Right? And so here I think you can sort of see that it's not just race, it's also sort of are they on the same level, right? If you think he's fine and you think she's not fine, right, then it raises questions about, well, is he with her because she's white, right? And so I think this comes up a lot when you talk to African Americans about sort of like, did you just get like any old white woman on the street? Right? You know, or are you with her because there's some special bond that you have in common, because she's actually really wonderful, right? Or is it just her whiteness that's sort of doing the work in terms of, of binding you to her in a relationship, right? And so that's an interesting sort of theme, sort of the intersection between attractiveness and race. Uh, and then I showed this image. This is Aisha Tyler and her then husband. Um, and so the first comment uh, that a student made was a sister sitting in the, black of the back of the room who said, good for her. Somebody loves her. And I was like, oh, OK. Let's talk about that, right? And she said, basically, you know, it's hard out there for black women. And she said, I'm not going to judge her the way that I judged Omari, because her options aren't the same, right? So I think this is actually a really important point, that basically structure matters, right? And so black women are not similarly situated to black men uh, in general, talking about heterosexuals now, in terms of romantic opportunity. We know from, for example, a recent Pew study that black men marry outside their race much more frequently than black women. According to this study, um, one out of, no, uh, one third of black men who have college degrees marry a non-black woman, right? Um, and so there are different opportunities. When, when I did the uh, recent program um, in, at Berkeley on, on Valentine's Day just a, a month ago, uh, one of the black male students who was an athlete said like, it's like white women are around you all the time and always chasing you. And there's just like this, this river of opportunity. And I was like, this is really interesting, <laughs> right? Um, and so 
again, the, 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 the configuration in terms of uh, race, gender, and sexual orientation matters, right? So for LGBT folks, um, our pool of opportunity is much smaller, right? So according to a study by Gary Gates, uh, formerly of the Williams Institute, um, the LGBT population is about the size of New Jersey, right? So if you are LGBT, like you're limited to one state and like everybody else has like 49 states, right? And so obviously your options are the same. Then you add race to the mix, right? Um, and the pool gets much smaller, right? And so I think this helps explain why we see higher rates of interracial coupling by um, basically all groups of people of color, right? So African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latinos, um, are coupled with people of other races much more frequently than heterosexuals, right? And some of that is based on opportunity and numbers. But I really wanted to ask sort of like, do we tell the same story about Wanda Sykes and her wife that we tell about Omori Hardwick and his wife? I think taking the structural opportunities into account requires a more nuanced story there. Um, so I could go on and on, because again, I love talking about this topic. Uh, and in the q and I'm sure you'll have questions for me. I'm just going to outline some of the uh, research questions uh, that we're looking at. And again, these are actually just like three of like a dozen questions that we're looking at overall. Uh, but um, sort of applying the research just to focusing on the black community for purposes of today. Um, one is, should black, black couples be the ideal in the black community? So here we can think about Barack and Michelle. Right, and so yeah, I heard someone like, "Yeah, right." So, you know, I, so, you know, I think as a black community, we have celebrated their relationship, their daughters, their family in the White House. Certainly in the Trump era, uh, we look back and we say, "Man, we had it good," right? And now it is important to note that not so long ago, as Professor Carbato and others have noted, there was a debate about is Obama black enough. Right? And so now, you know, we read them as a pure black, black couple, right? But there was a debate about that, right? And in many ways, some would say his marriage to Michelle sort of solidified his blackness in public view. Uh, but again, thinking about structure, what are the consequences specifically on black women and black LGBT folks when we say that a black, black relationship is the ideal, that we should all want to be Barack and Michelle? Right? If some people have less access to that, then are their interracial relationships deemed to be lesser than the ideal of the pure black relationship? The second question is, um, should black role models, Michael Sam, um, activists, celebrities, athletes, bear a special burden to choose a black partner? Right? Is there a sense that because you are an activist, you know, that sort of you have a special responsibility, especially if you're an anti-racist activist. So um, thinking back to, again, celebrities and Aisha Tyler, um, when um, we were talking about her and her husband, one person said, like, yeah, that makes sense that she'd be with a white man because she was on Friends. Right? And so I thought that was interesting to sort of, they were saying, like, look, she's not doing black media. She's kind of mainstream. And so that's kind of, her career is consistent with her, um, you know, with her, her marital choice, right? And so again, if someone is a Black Lives Matter activist, right, should we expect them of all people to have a black partner? So I had the honor of being on a panel with Alicia Garza in October of last year, and she sort of shared that her husband is a transgender, non-black man. Um, and I was sort of like, oh! And then I thought, like, why am I so surprised, <laughs> right? And so it's, again, I mean, do we make assumptions that somebody who is focused on black lives would marry somebody who is black, right? And should we question some of those assumptions uh, and, and understand where that's coming from? And much of this project is really trying to figure out sort of what's going on in terms of these narratives that we tell ourselves in terms of our reactions, like what's underneath them, right? Is it about, you know, is it, when we say it's about race, what does that mean? Is it about anti-racism? Is it about having a partner who's anti-racist that shares your political values, right? Is it about a symbolic statement saying that I chose a black partner and therefore I love black people and that if she hasn't partnered with a black person, she's not sending the right statement, right? Like what's going on there? And so for you, the story might be different than it is for me, but I want us all to think about sort of what we really care about when we say that the race of a partner matters. And then finally, um, how do interracial experiences shape dating relationships between black people? I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, so Bachelorette, like uh, this show, really fascinating. <laughs> um, uh, of course, Rachel is a lawyer searching for her perfect match. 
Um, and it's the first time that a black woman was the bachelorette. Um, and so there was a lot of pressure on her to pick a black man. And she said from the beginning, I'm not going to be persuaded by that. I'm going to do what's right for me. And so one question was sort of like, is she right to dismiss sort of the interest of the black community and her affirming black men or picking a black man? Or should she sort of put herself first? Um, and she ended up choosing a, uh, a Latino partner, uh, which most people online do not like, uh, not because he's Latino, but because he has issues. Um, <laughs> but one of the most striking, <laughs> sorry, I was not a fan of Brian. Um, but one of the most striking um, episodes was Rachel is having a date with a brother, I think it's Will is his name, um, and she's, and you know, in most of the dates, the, these guys are like, you know, wanting and dining her, treating her like a princess. That's the whole conceit of the show, right? Um, and she's kind of like, Will isn't like trying to touch me, isn't making me feel special, doesn't seem like he's very present. Then she finally calls him on it, and she's like, you know, I just have to know, like, um, what's your usual type? And he says, well, white girls. <laughs> and to me, it was so humiliating. Right, because the whole desire of the show is that she is the most desirable woman in the world, and all of these men are competing to marry her. And then to have a black man say on national TV, I usually like white girls. Right, it's interesting too, because then when she said why, he said, I grew up in the suburbs, and I was mostly surrounded by white people. And she said, well, I grew up in the suburbs too, and I dated mostly black men. And so again, structure, but different choices, right? So again, lots of fascinating stuff I can say about the bachelorette, but we're sh I don't wanna, you know, uh, uh, go too long on this, but I, I'm intrigued by thinking about how, thank you, how even when it's black people dating black people, um, impressions about one's past dating relationships and preferences may shape those relationships. Issues of trust and comfort, if you feel like, am I really somebody's type? Do they really want me or are they just waiting until, you know, a random white person comes along, right? So I think those sort of issues are really important to think about even when we're talking about black people dating black people. So I will stop right there. Thank you. Thank you both for wonderful presentations. I will open the floor up for questions right now. If All right, well, while you guys think of questions, I'll start. One thing that we've seen with the Trump administration, um, in May of last year, Trump signed an executive order basically announcing that his administration will vigorously enforce religious liberty protections and laws. And since that time, what we've seen is the federal agencies um, have gone out of their way or have been very intentional about rolling back anti-discrimination protections um, and other civil rights and, um, that have been secured over the years. And so this has affected both re reproductive rights, um, it has definitely a affected LGBTQ rights. And so one thing that I think a lot of civil rights um, scholars, advocates in this realm realize is that this will likely trickle over into each and every um, agency. So it's happened in HHS, it's happened with the Department of Education. Um, HUD has recently removed anti-discrimination language from their mission. And so one thing that I would love for you two to talk about or just briefly touch on is what you, foresee the legal realm looking like for both women, um, reproductive rights, women's reproductive rights, as well as LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights, um, as this clash between religious freedom and civil liberties and civil rights in other areas continues to ensue? I think that that's a great question. And I, you know, one of the things that's been consistent, I think, across <coughs> panels is to show that, you know, in many ways, it's not as if the Trump administration is starting anew, right? So Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, which was the case in which the Supreme Court uh, further advanced corporate personhood by saying that closely held uh, companies, and let's be clear that the overwhelming majority of companies in the United States are closely held over 90 some odd percent, and Hobby Lobby being a for-profit company with thousands of employees, that it could have protected religious views such that it could discriminate against its female employees by not providing in their insurance plans that these women could access contraceptive health care. Uh, and it was quite a problematic decision because it's also one that's void of science because the underlying justification of the companies is that they interpreted contraceptions to be contraceptives, three in particular, to be abortifacients. 
And you know, scientifically, it's really problematic that the Supreme Court just signs right on to their perception that since I believe it's like an abortion, then that is what it will be. And the problem in the case is further amplified by the court saying, well, this only applies right here. It doesn't apply to blood transfusions, meaning that those of you who may be Jehovah's Witnesses and not want to cover blood transfusions in your medical plans, you're out of luck. It also didn't apply to vaccines, which means that religious organizations that do not support vaccines, you're out of luck. This only applies against women because Hobby Lobby has no problem with providing vasectomies for men. Right, so it's very clear the very um, nature of the kind of sex discrimination that's coming out of that. And the Trump administration further hones this, though it was already really quite vibrant at the state level with a passage of laws that are called trap laws, targeted regulations of abortion providers, which have been uh, so problematic and deeply entrenched. And I'll just give you an example of one. And between 2010 and 2013, what's important to note is that that's the same space where we see the gerrymandering taking place, uh, suppression of black voters, but that's also the space in which we see more anti-abortion and anti-contraceptive laws being proposed and enacted than in 30 years prior combined. So a lot of heavy activity that combines both the race side and also the uh, sex side. And, and let me just close with the following. What else is on the horizon? So the day after uh, Donald Trump comes into office, he reinstates the global gag rule. And in a more intensive way, uh, that is that any NGO that receives any funding from the United States can't even mention the word abortion. It's not only that they can't do any research, it's not that they can't uh, provide these kinds of services, even if they're getting funds from another country to help support uh, women being able to terminate their pregnancies, they can not. So that's been uh, huge. The Trump administration has also expanded beyond Burwell v. Hobby Lobby because they've now put into regulation morality rules. So if you have a corporation and you are morally opposed, not religiously opposed, but you're just morally opposed to women being able to have access to contraception on your health plans, then you may then prohibit women from having that kind of access. And I'll close with this following point, which is that we have to be very mindful that even with Supreme Court victory, such as in Whole Woman's Health, where the Supreme Court strikes down two of Texas's trap laws, the year right after, the state of Minnesota, I mean last year, proposed the same laws. I was in Minnesota testifying against these laws, I mean, like the Supreme Court has ruled, and yet the same very laws, I mean, the there it is. Uh, you know, so you can't make that kind of thing up. So I think it's part the Trump administration, but it's also a very fertile soil for this kind of hate-filled activity towards women's reproductive health care. So two LGBT issues uh, that are um, very critical right now are the issue of um, bathroom access for transgender people and students in particular. So the Obama administration had issued guidance saying that schools have to let students use the restroom that's consistent with their gender identity. Um, that was challenged and went up to the Supreme Court, but then the Trump administration said, we're gonna revoke that guidance, and they did, so the case went away. Um, and so th I think this is you know, a, an ongoing issue. There are also states that are trying to pass laws uh, to allow or to require transgender people to, um, to use a restroom that's inconsistent with their gender identity and really expose them to violence. Um, and, in, and through um, doing some research on this, I learned you know, something that was just sort of stunning to me that you know, we take it as a privilege that if you need to use the restroom, there's always one available and you feel generally safe using it, right? And for a lot of even like transgender students at Berkeley that I talked to, you know, there are students that actually hold it in class because there's not a restroom where they feel safe that's close enough, right? And so that is a reality that people who dehydrate themselves, they're going out in public and they don't know whether there'll be a restroom that they can use, right? Um, and so it's really sort of sick to have these, you know, morality-based arguments by, you know, the president who's got Stormy Daniels suing him. Um, you know, that is, that these arguments are being used to deny people something as basic as a restroom. Um, the other issue that I'm looking at is on uh, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which is before the Supreme Court now. And so here we have a baker in Colorado 
that claims that he has an artistic right and a um, religious right not to make a cake for a gay wedding. This case, I think, could go either way. I'm actually very nervous about it. Um, it's disturbing to me that we are in, we live in Justice, Justice Kennedy's world, right? When it comes to LGBT rights, like he is sort of the decision maker. Um, and so he will decide whether or not there is a First Amendment right to discriminate based on sexual orientation. And I think he's going to rule in favor of LGBT rights, but he sent mixed signals at the oral argument. Um, and then there also have been rumors that he might retire. And if he retires, um, uh, you know, and Republicans have control of the Senate, then you know, our last line of protection, and again, it's, it's completely surreal that we're relying on Kennedy to protect us. And a lot of his, even the LGBT victories are problematic in many respects. That's like a whole nother panel. Um, but the idea that we could even lose that, you know, in the next few months is very concerning. Thank you. All right, I'll go with the red jacket and then the gray sweater and then the black jacket. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Edwin and Robinson for those lovely presentations. Um, and I think to that last comment, I really wanted to expand the conversation to uplift the experiences of transgender and gender non-conforming um, refugees and migrants yeah. who are currently locked up in cages in this country. Yeah. Um, so as a community advocate supporting LGBTQ refugees and migrants currently detained in immigration detention centers or immigrant prisons, um, the, um, the presence um, of sexual, physical, and psychological violence is horrendous. Um, so, um, and specifically, um, black LGBTQ refugees and migrants are often forgotten about in immigration detention. So a lot of them, Haitian immigrants and people from all over Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America and other black LGBTQ refugees and migrants are often detained for more than two plus years. And so in light of the Supreme Court ruling in Rodriguez versus Jennings where um, immigrants can be detained indefinitely, I really um, was hoping this convening would kind of have a, a more meaningful conversation on it um, because if refugees and migrants, specifically black LGBTQ, refugees and migrants are being forgotten about and detained for more than two years in the Supreme Court ruling, which is now back at the Ninth Circuit, um, can hold people indefinitely. What does that mean when um, they are not receiving care, when they're being traumatized and just um, violence being enacted? So I really wanted um, the panelists to reflect on that and like what kind of advocacy do you foresee the legal professionals in the room kind of take um, for the situation? So I'll, I'll take a, a, a quick um, a, a quick point at that, and I'm glad that you raised that because <clears throat> it isn't an issue that I have notes here to talk about, but you only have so much time, but it is important, right? Because it's another space in which this administration has specifically targeted detention center. Here I'm talking not so much trans, although the trans issues behind bars are significant, and trans issues not behind bars are significant, right? So violence, suicide, et cetera. I mean, it, it's real, and it's an area that has been less touched, you know, specifically within feminist jurisprudence, right? It's been left out and there have even been debates about whether or not feminist jurisprudence <clears throat> should add in space for trans women. And I think that that's very problematic to even frame it that way. But to your point, one of the attacks that we've seen from the Trump administration has involved uh, migrant girls who are in detention who've been raped where they've been blocking their access to terminate their pregnancies, where the Trump administration has said, well, it's an undue burden on them to have to move out of the way for these girls. And in, these are in cases where the government doesn't have to pay anything, the women, the young girls have gone through all of the processes that they need to go to, whether it is visiting a crisis pregnancy center, whether it is the wait period, you know, seeing a doctor or two times, the Trump administration has still said, well, even though you've gone through all of that, you make it a burden on us to have to fill out the paperwork. Now, those claims have failed, but I think what's also important to note with regard to the advocacy part is that the Trump administration has brought up ACLU, ACLU lawyers on violation of legal ethics and professional responsibility because they have advocated on behalf of these young women. And in one case in particular saying that after the DC Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that in fact the Trump administration had in fact violated the constitutional rights of a young girl who was in detention, then they helped the young girl to receive her abortion which was provided for and they said, well you did it too quickly. Right, um, so, so these are, are problems too, not just then when you have advocates 
but then an administration that will go after the advocates for actually doing their job. I'll just add that um, there's some great scholarship coming out about uh, incarceration and detention and LGBT people being overrepresented in those spaces. <clears throat> Specifically, there's a great study that I just read by Bianca Wilson and Elon Meyer, who are at the Williams Institute, that have found that, I hope I'm gonna get these stats right, 40% of um, girls in detention are LGBT identified, um, and most of them are black and brown, right? And so this is a major issue that, uh, fortunately there is some developing scholarly and activist work happening in terms of LGBT movements and scholars understand like we need to look at incarceration and this is a really important space. I think for too long, the focus was like explicitly on marriage and the most privileged people. And so there seems to be the beginning of a shift, but there's still a lot of work that has to be done. And just to piggyback off of that, mm -hmm. um, you can find Bianca Wilson and Elon Myers reports on our website, but also the Williams Institute. We are starting to do more research on criminal justice issues and to the extent possible, we are very intentional about being intersectional. So looking at the different minority communities, immigration, immigrant communities, um, and other subpopulations of the LGBTQ community that are affected by criminal justice issues. So we will continue to do work like that in upcoming years. So. And it's another ice dragnet space, right? I mean, so especially for domestic violence. So there are a lot of, um, there, there are women who are very afraid to actually go visit doctors or to file claims if they've been victims of domestic violence because they're afraid of uh, being uh, arrested and sent to a detention center. And there are actually cases of this in the reproductive space. There's a case involving a woman named, the last name Borrega uh, in Texas who was arrested after going in for um, an obstetric uh, appointment. It's, it's sad, I mean, she, she'd been in the process of this, and this is not an isolated case, but had been in the process of seeing her doctor over a period of time and went to visit her doctor at a different clinic than she typically would visit and had no idea that the medical personnel had actually called ICE. And when she went to the back to, to actually see her doctor, she was arrested. So I mean, so these are the kinds of other concerns that intersect the um, immigration space. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your, or both of you for your presentation. Um, it's been really, really informative. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about the way that we're sort of theorizing and framing the dialogue about women's rights um, as connected to primary and secondary sex organs, um, particularly, so if you're up here, example, Hobby Lobby is saying that sort of raise a sex or gender discrimination because women were not provided with reproductive um, resources as opposed to like men who were provided access to vasectomies. When, you know, there's instances of blur, there's sort of a blur in there, right? Where there are women who can have penises and men who can have penises or vaginas. So ways in which, you know, sort of like we're creating binaries and even when we're talking about it. Um, also an example of, um, I think it was the quote that you said, Dr. Robinson, um, removing sex from sex requires special power of calisthenics, right? So the way in which we're mapping sexuality to sex or gender first. And so then where, where do intersex folks, gender queer folks, gender non conforming folks fit when we're talking about sexuality? So I know either one of you could maybe talk about that. Before. Yeah, so I, I mean, I struggle with that critique. Um, I think we need to definitely make space to understand how trans and intersex people are impacted. But I don't think that that means we can't talk about penises and vaginas, right? Um, so, because I've heard that before from students and I feel like there needs to be an understanding that we can still talk about um, people who are cisgender um, and understand how discrimination operates against cisgender folks and also people who are trans, people who are intersex. So it, it, sometimes it feels like it's an attempt to silence a certain conversation, and I don't understand that move. So maybe we can talk more afterward, but do you want to add to I, I, I agree with you. I mean, and that, and that is the struggle. Absolutely that. I don't think that it has to be mutually exclusive uh, to be mindful of what's happening in trans communities and yet at the same time speak to the experiences that uh, women who are cis, cis women's uh, experiences and issues and to be able to speak to what it means to have a uterus and be discriminated against within the space of being a woman with a uterus and being also a trans woman 
uh, or being a trans man who has a uterus and still has uh, hurdles to overcome within the healthcare space. And I think what we need is actually more dialogue and more challenge of ourselves within these spaces. This is the type of work that I try to do right now at UCI. We actually have multiple programs going on in this very space um, that include a film festival on these particular issues and also a conference that I'd invite everybody to at the end of April that is addressing um, trans issues in healthcare. We have time for one last question. Go ahead. Um, thank you for a very interesting <laughs> late afternoon uh, presentation. Both of you were wonderful. Um, I was wondering, this is for Professor Goodwin, if you looked into a comparison of this administration, not just the president, the executive, but also Senate and Congress, and their um, reaction to the heroin epidemic as opposed to the heroin epidemic. Um, yeah. You know, as uh, everybody knows, you know, the heroin epidemic hasn't touched the black community. Yes. In the same way, um, and that's why we work. Yes. No, it's not why we're not addicted to heroin to the same degree. Um, but to look at the government's reaction in comparison. That's a great question, and let me just say that it's been dramatically different, right? Um, first of all, the framing has been very different. The framing hasn't been that people are heroin moms or heroin dads. Uh, even though we've seen the visuals of parents literally knocked out in the front seats of their car um, and their children in the back seat, that hasn't been used in a way that uh, dehumanizes or degrades those parents. Uh, the narrative, uh, both at the congressional level, the state level, and even from the president himself has been one of a language of compassion, which I think is correct. I think that that's the space that one needs to be in, but it's been dramatically different than the way in which black parents were portrayed, the way in which black mothers were portrayed, the whole narrative of being the bad mom in these spaces, and that's not the same in the way in which we've considered either the heroin epidemic or the opioid epidemic. And I can tell you, having worked in this space for quite a bit and written in this space, it's amazing also how audiences see this as, as different. I've been saying for quite a while that there is no difference. And in fact, if you know the science, there is no difference, right? The sort of, you know, what's the science of crystallized cocaine versus cocaine versus this in, uh, in a pill form? I'll, I'll just make a point. There's been a longitudinal study that tracks the use of prescription medications during pregnancy, and it's probably in about its 50th year now. And what the data shows is that there has been an escalation of the use of prescription medications during pregnancy, but the, the people who are using those are educated white women with high incomes. And we're not talking about the use of one prescription medications. It's called cocktailing, where it's Demerol, Oxycontin, and several other drugs. And the justifications have been, of course, well, doctors are supposed to treat their patients. So she says, I have a headache, I've got a backache, my feet are swelling, I'm having difficulty walking, here's a pill, here's a pill, here's a pill. But there is a way in which that's treated as doing a moral good for people who are morally upstanding. It's not the same as true for black women. And I'll close with the following, is that I was giving a talk at, um, an elite law school about this uh, some years ago. And I made the point that there was no difference. The only difference is socioeconomic and insurance, basically. And it, one of the audience members basically went a little bit apoplectic. No, there must be difference. There has to be difference. Doctors would never give anything to a pregnant woman that wasn't good for her. How could you compare a woman who's using you know, pain medications during pregnancy that are prescribed by her doctor to a woman who's gotten some crack off the street? Well, his wife had recently undergone a pregnancy. And in my view, it was probably deeply personal. Um. You guys assist me in giving our panelists one more round of applause.